This is a podcast from ComediansComedian.com. This is the Comedians Comedian Podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Stuart Goldsmith and apologies for the state of my voice. It's due to another excellent Glastonbury Festival and all the attendants shouting, uh, screaming and extremes. And that was just the parenting. Um, So sorry, I'm a little bit scratchy today. Uh, From me, though, we segue smoothly to someone who has a fine voice for singing, improv, characters uh, and all sorts of other incredible, elastic and flexible performative things. Uh, This is the brilliant Pippa Evans. Before we get into Pippa, just a reminder that There is one week left of the new uh, Polly Becker designed horse t-shirts pre-sales discount uh, for all your merch from comedianscomedian.com go to comedianscomedian.com forward slash merch there is still one week left of the pre-sale of these sweet teas uh, before they go on sale at regular price so go there and check them out now though the brilliant Pippa Evans are you going off at the moment what does you, that mean? Have you just like, is it all, is it all going off at the moment? Are you doing London Palladium? Have I did, you done I that? did Live at the London Palladium last, it came out a couple of weeks ago. Okay, yeah. I haven't yeah. seen that, I'm sorry. I haven't no, that's that fine. No, I, I don't expect you to have seen much of my stuff actually because we're often either at the same time or also that thing of when I stopped, I think we gigged when I was being Loretta mainly. Yes. And then I sort of stopped doing that. Yes. And so then I've sort of gone off into my own little world. Well, there's a ton of YouTube stuff of you doing Loretta. Yeah. Um, either at gigs or stuff that you've produced and made music videos. Yeah, and yeah. And then there's, if you search Pippa Evans stand up, there's very, very little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's mostly Loretta. Yeah. But I did see your Edinburgh show. I saw same, same, but different. Oh, did they give it? Did, oh, you came? Of yes, I did. did. I snuck did. in. Okay, yes. great. Yes, yes. I oh, snuck good. in and sweated in Bannermans with everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's all sort of changing, really. I feel like comedy is like a Venn diagram of all the different bits of your life, and you have to get, you have to find this point where all the Venn diagram, all the circles meet, and then you find that little bit in the middle, and you go. <gasps> There's my voice. Oh, um, that's a lovely way of putting it. Do, flesh out that metaphor for me. What sorts of things so, are in the circle? Um, so, so for me, so obviously music is a big part of what I do and I love it. But I also love doing talking stand-up, but I I never just want to be a pure stand-up, which I think I wrestled with for a long time because, uh, as you will know, as a stand-up person, that stand-ups often make jokes which are, you're, you're not a real comedian. And because, because I, I worry a lot, I would think... They're right. I'm not a real comedian. I must talk more. So I would worry about that. And then I sort of stopped worrying about it and went, well, no, what I want to do is make sure that each of those circles is as strong as each other. So it's like, okay, so I've got my, uh, so I've got my musical comedy circle, I've got my talking stand-up circle and I've got my improv circle. And I just needed to find a place where those three things met. Uh, There's also this fourth circle for me, which is like, um, so it's probably the same as improv, but it's this sort of people I really like people so how do you do a sort of big influence for me is like Michael Barrymore's my kind of people and, <laughs> and Brian Connolly show from the 90s like those, okay. were, the, those were the shows I loved Re- so remind how, me my, I think I've seen my kind of people but what my, what kind, <laughs> my kind of people was where he would be like he just meet someone someone you know some producers would have found some like kid who's had a hard time and he talked to them and then have a joke together and they go you can sing that, can't you, Mary? And then <laughs> Mary would get up and sing a song, and it was just really lovely. It was like such a nice program. So there's something about that kind of enjoying the audience as much as me. So I suppose rather than it being all about me, it being like, well, here's me, but let's see how we can get you involved in a way that's actually sharing the space rather than I own the whole space. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. Uh, yeah, so sort of how do you get those four circles to meet in the middle? And I think we're finally getting there, uh, which is exciting. So talk to me about about the the blocks in between. When you say we're finally getting there, oh, yeah, yeah. What sorts of things were impeding? Getting uh, okay, there? so uh, well, because I so when I was doing it live at the London Palladium, uh, I had a really long conversation with Bradley Walsh about how I should have been a red coat uh, <laughs> okay. or, or a blue coat. I think he was a blue coat. I can't remember which one. What's he was. the difference? I don't so know a blue, uh, one is Butlins and one is Pontins. Fine. I think. I think. The, and these are for the benefit of the uninitiated. Oh, yeah. These are the, the entertainers at the holiday camps, uh, okay. which is where Brian Connolly, Bradley Walsh, Shane Ritchie, all those. Classic entertainer types came yes. from people who uh, have done have done a bit of stand up, but they're entertainers, not comedians. Yeah, so but they fulfil like they're they're sort of 
culturally quite significant in the mm, UK. But also that I that you I've heard you talk on your podcast before about that battle between the entertainer and the comedian, and uh, and I've I've often had that battle with myself because I am more of an entertainer than a comedian, I'd say, and uh, and I think for ages I was like I don't know where I fit, I don't know who I am. Uh, and then I think there's a, such a kind of a breath of fresh air that comes in when you realise everybody has that thing and it just takes time. And then once you get that, you can relax and you feel much better about it all. Um, okay. I can't remember which question I was um, answering. So you were talking to <laughs> Brian Conley. Oh, so Bradley Walsh. Oh, Bradley yeah, Walsh, yeah. sorry. So I was talking to Bradley Walsh about how I should have, I should have, maybe I should have been a red coat. Uh, and uh, he was like, he was like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's weird, isn't it? Uh, that, you know, that wasn't, that's just not a thing that's offered to, uh, middle class girls who go, went to a private school that you know you're never going to finish school and they go right not university for you you need to go and be a red coat that that should have been what my career advice should have been but then my dad I talked to my dad about it and he said yeah but you at one point you wanted to be a serious actress uh, and I was like I think that was a cover up I think it was yeah. a real cover up of <laughs> oh. I want to be a comedian yeah totally but, but you go oh, well, I don't know how to be a comedian but there's a clear path to be an actor so so yes. that's that's a bit easier and also there's something frightening. It's much easier to do the thing you're less interested in than it is to um, to be the thing you definitely know you want to be. So, you know, my influences, like I say, were these entertainers and Victoria Wood and so this kind of character side of things. Maybe that's the other circle of my Venn diagram. Maybe there's five circles to it. So, no, and no, I think the more circles, five. I think the more circles, the harder it is to find that middle point. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so try, trying to find these things. So the, the block for me was... Uh, listening too much to advice so listening too much to other people like what you should do rather than just going I think I know what I need to do uh, but it's again it's much easier if someone says do this and you do it and it fails then you can go it's their fault not my fault totally uh, right yeah so that so that's uh, that was a bit of a block for me and also I think once you start doing something so like, it's basically Theresa May's problem which is uh, I said I was going to do this so I'm going to do this rather than uh, I said I'm going to do this and so uh uh, uh, but it doesn't really work anymore. So I'm going to start trying something else. So it took a long time for me to drop Loretta Main, even though I felt quite uncomfortable with it for a while because it was going really well and people love it. So you go, oh, well, if it's successful, surely then I should be happy. But it doesn't work like that, Stuart. Okay, let's stay with that for a bit because as you said, that's that, I've seen you do Loretta several times. Mm. And so Loretta Main is, in your words, who is she? Loretta Main is a uh, country grunge singer, I would call her, and she is just pissed off with the world and she cannot understand why she's not a superstar, even though it's clearly her attitude and the fact that she's always drunk uh, and that uh, she um, yeah, is, is uh, just really angry. And was she one of the first characters that you did or was she one of the first? No, she was one of the first things that people really responded to. So I, I, have, a, I have a load of other characters I did in that show. That was from my Edinburgh show 2008, which was called Pippa Evans and Other Lonely People. And I've se- I, I remember one of them had a brilliant name like Amangela. That's right, Amangela. Amangela, yeah. 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 <laughs> so Amangela was very popular with comedians uh, and some audiences, but other people didn't really couldn't really get it because I can't really explain what she was. She was just a lady who had her skirt pulled up, uh, just my mum's old skirt pulled up really high, and I still have it. And she was off, off of the, them party rings, and she lived with her cat Max and just spoke. Every line was a punch, like a punch, set up punchline, set up. But it was really, it was like a really well crafted character, but would never go anywhere. Uh, kind of a bit like, um, I suppose, like Angelos. You know how Dan uh, had to, Dan Skinner had to put Angelos, who is a character off uh, the reboot of Shooting Stars. He had him like, you know. 15 years ago but you had to put him in a drawer because everyone was like what are you going to do with that yes. so so I suppose yes. in some ways uh, I've put Loretta in a drawer rather than I've dismissed her entirely Okay. it was just that so so Loretta I did for in that show and people just went wow this is really great uh, because I can actually sing and I can write songs so it really worked as a character in a club because um, I think when you do a character in a club there needs to be a real reason why they're there like I hate when they go Oh, I was just passing by and the yes, contest said I could have mean. 10 minutes yes. rather than I'm a singer who's just been allowed on this bill. So she worked really well in that context. Uh, interesting fact for you. Uh, so I, I uh, discovered Loretta when I was uh, first starting out and I would work a lot with Luke Tolson. And um, me, him and Holly Walsh were going to do a thing together uh, in 2000. And- it must have been seven or something. I love it. I love and, hearing about like yeah, cabals as yeah, years passed. Yeah. Come on. And Holly then was like... I'm too busy. I can't do it. But we'd already booked a 20 minute slot at some character night. And, uh, and it's so funny in those early days when you go, well, we can't let them down. Like as if <laughs> the world will end rather than ringing them up and saying, I'm really sorry, but 
we've lost our one, one member of our group. One of the hundred people on the yeah, reserve yeah, list. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So me and Luke were like, okay, what can we do well between the two of us in two days time? And, um, and I said, well, I can sing and you're very sarcastic. So why don't you interview me as a singer? And so I just wrote a few songs very quickly. And then he interviewed me. And originally she was a okay way. Uh, so Loretta Mine was originally really quite positive. Um, but she said all these quite nasty things. So it didn't quite work. Um, and then, uh, but I could feel there was something in it. Uh, at that gig and then I did a gig maybe like a week later and I just thought well, I'll just try America and see what happens and it was just like all all came together to the point that people were scared of me and thought I really was because I did it at a few nights that weren't comedy nights that were sort of mixed billy kind of things yes so people would just thought I was this hideous woman who and it's come performed over. it's kind of introduced at face value isn't oh yeah yeah there's yeah. no and I don't let up I, I'm not like Marcel, so like in terms of when I come off stage, I will be Pippa, and I, I'm no, I have no problem with people knowing it's a character because yes. I think I still think it's as funny once you know it's a character. Sure. Um, but I, so I think it works uh, either way. But people really responded well to it. Yeah. So, so just before we go into, and I'm really fascinated with this idea of you feeling like you should keep doing something because it was successful. I want to put a pin in that. But before we get onto that, just talk a bit more about what it was about Loretta that was working so well. So it was she, she was there for a she had a reason to be there. She so had a reason to be there. She had a really clear uh, worldview, which mm-hmm. I think is really important, whether particularly with a character, of, um, and uh, and it and it's performed really well. So it's like a it's a fully fleshed out character and this and like I say the songs I can sing so it's reasonable to believe that I maybe am a singer my American yes. accent is really good so people could believe that I was American they wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily question where I'm from yes so and you can look she was a character that was the the voice the perse- the personality of the character was you could look at her I mean when I think of Loretta I think of like that album cover or like the, the poster yeah, with, yeah. with the mascara yeah, everywhere yeah. you look at it you go I know exactly what that is you know I know exactly what she thinks she about is. everything yeah and yet, you know, she she wasn't a character. I don't think that kind of surprised us with her worldview. No, she, no. You know, she, like her songs, the ones I remember about, like um, you know, wanting loving someone so much, you want to trap them in a box yeah, and yeah, sing yeah. it and keep them there forever and that Absolutely, kind of. Absolutely, yeah. And then and then as she, so, I think I did three solo shows with Loretta, and then as it grew. Uh, the songs became more diverse because I also, my, my friend Duncan, so Duncan Walsh Atkins, who writes a lot of um, or, um, my songs for The Now Show, which is a radio, BBC radio show um, with me. Uh, he is very, uh, not is, is it candid is the way of saying it? Uh, that he was like, yeah, when I first saw it, I thought, well, this is not going to last because it's only... It's only um, angry love songs and there's that's never going to go anywhere. And, and it was good that he said that because... It made me go, oh, yeah, so let's look at some different ways of how does she do other things in life. So let's look at her backstory. Let's look at um, her ambition. Let's look at um, her hobbies, her pets, you know, all the other bits of life. So really, really fleshing her out so she could uh, have she could have a sitcom if you wanted. She could write her memoirs, all Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Okay, And it, it seemed to me from the outside, I suppose my preconception is that you you kind of performed what I'm terming and what I hope catches on. You performed a broadkin. You kind of took the, uh, you took an existing character, yeah. which was doing great, and then sort of stepped back from it. And I think for a while, were you almost doing the same songs, but as you? Uh, oh, well, and when, when I started being me? When you started being you, did you kind of step so, back from Loretta, but yeah. still try to use the material? And kind of, that's what I mean by a, oh, yeah, a song yeah, broadkin, right, okay. Lee Nelson, kind of like, there's the character. I'm still that character, but I'm not as much that character because that doesn't suit the purpose anymore. Well, interesting. Uh, so there's a cut. I probably only do two or three songs of Loretta's now. Uh, and that's because they... that. So what started me questioning Loretta was that more and more her material was me. And and okay. I started going. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think Loretta would think. I think I'm trying to trying to push myself. My, oh, that's myself, great. Okay. Like a, like a cocoon. Like I like the idea of Loretta <laughs> as my safety cocoon <laughs> as I was developing my own voice. And it's like yes. so the the comedy world will accept this because it's a po- a package and it's really you know. And I love performing live. I think that's really important to say. And so for me, the fear was like you won't be able to perform live because because people you know quite rightly I think and sometimes wrongly but generally promoters go. Well, I don't know what Pippa Evans is, but I know what Loretta Main is, yeah. and I know that audience was like that. And at the end of the day, they need to have a satisfied audience, and I, I take that very much, very seriously. Like I'm really, I feel like the audience 
we have such a um, responsibility as performers for for audiences nights out and and that they've you know paid that money for a babysitter and tickets and we just we need to make sure they have a good time uh, uh, whatever that good time manifests itself as um, so so I think that's what the cocoon was it was like okay well I can't go out and perform as me while I'm being a bit shit okay so Loretta was uh, something I really enjoyed doing for a long long time and then ended up finding it frustrating Yes, and the the reason for that frustration was pure. Was it solely to do with the, the inability of her voice to express things you wanted to express? Yeah, I think so. Especially because I'm actually quite a calm, happy person, uh, and uh, and I'm also mar- married and living in a flat. In, and like, I'm quite bored. Like a lot of time, I'd be doing her tweets of like, "Oh my god, I just got out of a skip," and I'd be in bed <laughs> with a cup of tea, you know. And I was like, "So there's fun on, in in one way, but in the other way, I was like, I sort of feel like this is a voice we know. So what's the voice that I'm not? I'm okay. not giving my I'm not giving my voice, which isn't that I have. And I think a long time I was strangled by I have nothing to say. Like I've got no point to make. As you, as, as me, as people. Yeah. But Loretta doesn't have any point to make. She doesn't accept that she's fucking pissed off. Yes. So, okay. so why do I feel like I have to make a point? It's like no, you don't have to make. You just need to make people laugh. That's your your purpose as a comedian is to make people laugh. You can make a point if you want, but you don't have to be making a point. Let's look at this from the idea of from the perspective of a voice. Mm. Because I don't know that Loretta was making a point so much as having a very clear yes. voice. And are you trying to find a similar clarity of voice as Pippa? Or are you kind of content for what you do to simply, to, for what you do to be what you do? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think my voice is the contradiction of my voice, literally. So my opening joke is now is always, I suffer from posh voice, no money. Yeah. Uh, because people hear my voice and assume. Uh, I was sort of child who had a pony. Yeah. Um. Uh. But the but uh. Because people do people hear me speak and and I think again that was maybe what Loretta was about as well was like I can't go on stage and speak like this when I'm not I'm not really posh like say Miles Jupp plays or Simon Evans. Uh. They do this whole sort of grand thing, and uh. And and I'm not I'm not like Cockney. So so that that tick box thing I find really difficult because yes. I'm not a tick box. I'm a bit of a sort of mongrel. <laughs> so sure. so I'm not like oh the working classes and I'm not oh England it should be like how it used to be. And um, but then but then now I really embrace that and go actually I'm such a confused person because I was brought up listening to Gilbert and Sullivan and Chaz and Dave. So how how am I supposed to know what my voice is? Yes. Because I've got so many voices in me, which is probably why I'm so good at doing voices and also why I'm really good at, at um hearing someone talk about something going oh yeah that sounds interesting oh yeah I think I really agree with you and then hearing someone else and I go oh no that sounds quite interesting I'm like you (laughs) and I think a lot of people feel like that actually a lot of people go are going through life going who am I yes which is why all the musicals have songs called who am I (laughs) yeah Uh, and so realizing that actually with you know everyone is continuing to figure out who they are until they die like even my you know I talk to my parents and they still feel like they're not quite sure what their purpose in life is, like you're in your 70s. <laughs> yes, God, I would have hoped. <laughs> that, yeah, I don't know yeah. if that makes me feel good to hear that people yeah. in their 70s still worry about that. But I don't think they're worried about it. It's the fact that you yeah. accept it. You go, yes. you go, actually, and also the fact that we need to be comfortable and the fact we don't know who we are for longer. So, so that fact that, again, I think it's like something to do with how we were taught at school like what are you going to be i'm going to be a fireman great that's it your choice has been made you're that's who you are it's like why are we making 10 year olds make these decisions yeah it should be what would you like to start life off being and then decide you don't want to do anymore yes i mean that is not that is not taught as a, a precept of life is no. it that almost everyone does a thing for a bit and then changes yeah yeah and even people that have ended or maybe up... almost everyone we know i mean I, yeah, are no, there no, still no. people that just do one thing yeah there are because I've, I've got friends who do have done just one thing uh uh, and that, but that choice, ha- they've made that choice often consciously. I mean, so we are talking about a group of people who have the ability to make that choice because they're not yes. forced into something. Sure. But um, but they but they've made that choice so they can make other choices. So I've got a friend who works nine to five, uh, does not care about their job because they love partying and going to festivals and um, and socialising and being with family and friends. That, that's and that's why. So they see work simply as a thing to do, whereas I think as a Performer, I think we find that really hard to understand. Like, but why would you do something that you don't worry about twenty four seven? That yes. you're not really passionate about? That you don't wake up in the middle of the night and go, 
Chutney, that was the answer. Yes, Quick, write it down. It's very <laughs> difficult. If anyone ever would say to me, oh, it's just a job. Mm. Be, no, oh, you man. fundamentally don't understand. But they, it is sort of, it's just a job, isn't it? Absolutely. And maybe uncoupling that idea of like, I, this is every fibre of my being. Yeah, well, I think it's like useful. letting, it can be every fibre of your being as long as occasionally you can put it down. So... So if it's make, if it's um, every fiber of your being and it's making you ill, then maybe we need to step back from it. So I, I sort of feel like, again, this, this is the contradiction of the best performers are the ones who put their full heart and soul into it, uh, but are, I think, generally also able to then go to a baby shower or a family picnic or something and not be sitting there going, I hate all these people. So this is Pippa. Lots more to talk about with her uh, coming up shortly. We'll talk about Sunday Assembly, which is an, a bewilderingly uh, uh, successful thing that she set up with Sanderson Jones, formerly a comedian. And uh, uh, it's a well, you will. I, I'm not going to even try and describe it. I'll leave that up to her. That's coming up. And we'll also talk a bit more about Showstopper and all of the other bits and bobs she's doing, including her Edinburgh Fringe show. Now, not only am I going to be at the Fringe this year with Like I Mean It, the new hour, the seven. Christ, can it be seven hours? The seventh hour of stand-up comedy um, in my own personal repertoire, which is, of course, 3.45 daily at the Liquid Rooms Annex from the 5th to the 27th of, of the festival, because August might as well be called Edinburgh. Um, but not only will I be up there with a bunch of other of my recent guests and indeed my forthcoming guests, including Barry Cryer, Simon Munnery, and uh, plenty of other people besides, but... Uh, I will also be doing Everyone's a Comedian. Now, this is a thing, a, a comedy experiment that we here at Comedians Comedian, by which I mean mostly me, have devised in an attempt to... Well, what is it an attempt to do? It, it's really just an attempt to have an idea and make it exist as a physical thing in the real world. As soon as I had the idea, I sort of felt I couldn't not do it. I know lots of you have uh, comedy aspirations and I know lots of you are professional comedians and indeed newbie and aspiring comedians but some of you will never perform uh, through choice because you've got far too much on your plate or because you don't want to or because you find the the fear crippling or any one of a hundred other reasons but that doesn't mean you're not funny it doesn't mean you can't generate the beginnings of something the beginnings of an idea that could go on to be funny so I have thrust myself into the uh, the spotlight. I won't call it the limelight because, let's face it, this could go horribly wrong. But what I'm going to do is perform an hour entirely crowdsourced from your material. Now, remember, you can't submit to this uh, if you have ever performed uh, or if you're... I mean, I was going to say if you, if you ever will. Who knows what will happen in the future? But the point is, this is not for comedians. This is for that section of the listenership of this podcast who are real people, civilians, the proper job arati. Um, if you have ever come up with some stuff or if you ever see a thing and think, oh, I've always thought that'd be funny, or you've come up with a little one-liner or a dad joke, these, these are not uh, creative commons things. These are not pub jokes or existing funny things. This is just things that you've thought yourself. Um, then you can submit it and I will perform it. And I'm only going to see the material. I think what we're going to do is I'm going to see it an hour before I go on. So I get the chance to go, right, that's that, that's that. We might even reduce that further. It might be more fun if it was five minutes. Because <laughs> let's face it, I'm getting pretty scared. Um, the uh, I contacted Daryl, to whom all your submissions are currently sent. And uh, and I said, should I be worried? He said, we've had, I mean, it's, it's we've had a good few um, submissions. And uh, he said, some of them, what was his? exact words some of them are god awful but there are some gems so that's good no i don't mean to put any of you off i you know what does daryl know about comedy he's just an editor of a podcast or two podcasts and a comedian but uh, <laughs> what, what does a comedian know about comedy what do any of us this is sort of the point i would love you to send in your stuff it's comedianscomedian.com forward slash experiment and on one night only once at this year's edinburgh festival i will perform the stuff and try to get to the, the kernel of your idea and try to make it funny. And I'm not going to go up there and slag you off. I feel bad now that I've said Daryl said it was god awful. Uh, Daryl, maybe you should remove this bit. No, keep it in. There will be integrity. Um, I Actually, Daryl, does that drop you in? It cocks. It probably does a bit, doesn't it? Uh, I like the jeopardy of pointing out that they're that some of them are bad. <laughs> I think, I, you know, there'd be no jeopardy in this if everyone was just writing in brilliant stuff. But we don't want to betray the listener. 
And besides, who is the arbiter of comedy? Just because you don't like it, Daryl, doesn't mean it's good. Daryl, please keep in this entire bit of me talking to you. I think it reveals a layer of integrity to the podcast that we should stick with. So listen, here's the thing. I'm going to perform the stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun. And the point of me doing it is not to mock you or make fun of you. The point of me doing it is to attempt to wield my own comedy skill and experience to try and get to grips with what it is about what you've submitted that you find funny. That's There we go. We should. Daryl, we're definitely leaving this in because I've just nailed the premise. That's what we're trying to do. So submit your stuff. And you can also tick a little box there that uh, it basically says it's OK with you if I record it and then make it available for free later. Um, but uh, uh, that's the plan. Also, the stuff goes back to being yours. And I don't intend to turn it into a thing. Uh, of my own. You're not going to see me doing it on Conan years from now. That's absolutely not the plan. Um, but there it is. So that's that. That, that was as rambling and bewildering uh, uh, an introduction to the premise as you could expect from me. So uh, you know where to go for that. And thank you for your donations, of course. Um, I'd like to thank Andrew, who says, thanks for all your hard work. Glad finally to have joined the 2%. <laughs> that's very kind of you, Andrew. That's a reference to the number of you that actually donate. And I'm very pleased about it, too. Um, someone called Darren says, I, someone called Darren. That's not a polite way of doing it. Let's go again. Darren. <laughs> Darren says, I own too many T-shirts now, but I wanted to make an equivalent expression of support. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you very much for your donation, Darren. Um, if you would like to support the show with a regular subscribe uh, subscription, or if you would like to donate with a one-off donation, you can do them all at comedianscomedian.com forward slash donate. Uh, and remember, currently you are the only thing that keeps this podcast going. So if you're a T-shirt user or wearer, get a T-shirt as part of the pre-sale running for one more week or just afterwards for slightly more money at comedianscomedian.com forward slash merch or go to forward slash donate and you can set up your own means of supporting the show because that's, you know, that's the only reason I get to go to... Montreal and LA the last couple of years and exciting places like that and bring back new and exciting interviews with new and exciting comedians and it also helps me pay the people who help me along the show who help me edit it and make it possible because let's face it as the varying demands of parenthood and cranking out another hour <laughs> and also not simply cranking out another hour because let's 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 not forget churning out stuff churning out again that's the wrong word um what am i trying to say it's it would be hard enough to simply crank out another hour that was fine and that's not what i'm trying to do i'm trying to rewrite the rule book every single time and that takes time and time costs money so if you enjoy the show if you enjoy the work the research that goes into this podcast uh, and you would like to support it then please do donate to it thank you to all of you that have that will do for now let's get back to pippa evans and i'll have a quick post amble chat with you after we conclude the interview back to pippa is this question of what is your comic voice is that sort of resolved for you now do you feel that you have found your comic voice as much as loretta had hers uh no 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 i think but i think it's just a bigger project isn't it if you want to do i so i think i think for me if you want to be the best performer you could ever be you should probably never say i found my comic voice <laughs> yeah well I'm, so, I'm, i don't want to trick anyone yeah, it's, yeah, because yeah, i do yeah, worry yeah. about people listening going <laughs> oh have you but I, I, I mean to your satisfaction or to oh, your... Oh, no, no. Well, and I don't think I'll ever be satisfied either. So in the same... So so I'm also in Showstopper, the improvised musical, which I know we haven't talked about yet, but probably works in this context because we've been working on that show for 10 years and uh, and we won an Olivier last year and we're the first improv show ever to win an Olivier. And and for me, that the reason we won that Olivier is because we worked so freaking hard on that show. We constantly practice our skills and are constantly pushing to improvise a musical to a West End standard, which means we have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and we can never rest on our laurels, um, which sounds exhausting, but it's so satisfying because we're all working together and all so passionate about the project. And in the same way, I feel like, uh, so I feel like I'm really happy with where I'm at, with what I'm doing. Uh, and I really, I'm really pleased that I found the beginnings or the, or a sort of a, a safe space uh, uh, or whatever of my voice so I'm in a place where I know what my my voice is to an extent but we can hone and hone and hone until until I think that I can write I'd, I'd like to get to a point where I could like write instantly in my voice but I really write longhand and have to edit a hell of a lot to get 
the material out. And I don't know if that's ever going to change, but I feel like I could definitely write less. <laughs> Does that make any sense? You could spend said? less time writing and mm -mm. do better stuff, do you As mean? As in, or? because I think if I was slightly more focused, maybe I could write more. But then when I think about that, when I wrote Loretta and I knew exactly what her voice was, I'd write for ages. Maybe that's just how I write, is I write loads and loads of shit and then edit it down. I generally write about three hours for every hour. Uh, yes, okay. So uh, three to one. Uh, are you writing, when you say out longhand, with yeah, a pen? with a pen. I'm a pen and paper kind of person. Have you got stacks of Stacks notebooks? and stacks of notebooks. I think there's tons over there. There's loads of books. Uh, yeah, ton. I keep all my notebooks. And do you write, are you are you disciplined in your writing? Do you do, you do a certain number of hours no. a day, week, anything like that? No, no, not at all. Because I do so many different things, which is uh, also, I think, also why it's taken a long time to get the Venn diagram squishing down uh, is uh, means that I just write when I can and when I I often block out like a week or something and say right this week I'm going to do this 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 and this um, but it's not disciplined in a kind of every day I've so many times I've tried to do I think it's called the Richard Herring technique where you mark an X on the day and then the next as Seinfeld I believe is it Seinfeld yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry all, Richard all due respect to Rich <laughs> and, and I'm sure Seinfeld didn't invent it but he certainly popularised it he said it's the chain you have to that's the chain you yeah, have to yeah, make a yeah, little yeah. cross on every day of your calendar and you, that's so you wrote funny. and your only job is to make sure that the chain never breaks yeah so I love right that that's time. become the Richard Herring it's so, so funny <laughs> again in improvisation all of the uh teaching methods like all of the work the little games or whatever you play have been taught by someone to someone else yeah so, of course so it means when you're teaching improvisation you say i learned this this technique from i don't know lauren shearing and then and then someone will say oh lauren i did your exercise this and she'll be like oh, i didn't do that it's from susan messing <laughs> you know so so that funny thing of cha the chain of of where things come from uh, but anyway, so I was trying to do that and all it did was make me really feel shit about myself and go, because because I just couldn't do it. And the reason I couldn't do it is because I'm doing other things that feed my comedy. So it's it's sort of like, um, I think, and I think that comes back to me not being a straight stand-up comedian. Yes. So I'm not a straight stand-up comedian. So if I spend the day working with showstopper improvising musicals, I'm learning skills that help me in my end up in my show because I improvise songs and I write songs. So so I have to I had to teach myself that that is also writing if you want to use the term writing. Where do you, do you feel like a self-disciplined person? You are, you do an awful lot of things. Yes. And I suspect, are you, are you troubled by lack of self-belief? <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, <laughs> some, only so, like sometimes, yeah. But like, not all the time. I, I don't, I, I used to be really like terrified all the time of like, what the fuck am I doing? Because, because again, like, I really, I'm so glad that like, so I'm almost 35, which again, isn't that, that isn't that old for a comedian. And I think every time I read someone like, oh, they didn't make it till they were 40, I go, <sighs> <laughs> yeah. you know? uh, and it's true. And uh, I had a big epiphany when my great aunt Nellie died. So my great aunt Nellie was 104 and she died. And I used to go and hang out with her quite a lot. She was really fun, but uh, she died. And you know, when people die, people generally go, um, go, it makes you think, doesn't it really got to ride the bull by both horns, take the bull by both horns, is that phrase? <laughs> We've got to get on a bull and milk it. Uh, and uh, and I thought, oh, that's 104, that's so long, like what ages? Like why am I stressing so much about? And I think there's this, like, this thing of like, until you've hit some certain goals, then you haven't been successful. Or And also um, Adam Megiddo, who's the, the director of Showstopper, he's great. He said to me once, he said, you must notice the things that you have achieved. And I was like, oh, that's a good point. Yes. So making sure that like if I win something or I have a great show, taking the day off the next day and being like, yay me, and then getting back to work. So there's yes. obviously the Millican principle of yes. uh, you know, no good show. You know, you can't, you can't wallow in a show and you can't yeah. ride on a show for too long. It's not an absolute um, rule. Uh, no, no, but I like no, but I love that as a rule because I think it's very important, as particularly for newer acts. I think because when you're you know, once you've done ten years or so, whatever we've done now, like you know that shit gigs happen and you don't beat yourself up so much. But when you're new, you're like, my career is over because the people of Reading didn't respond well. You know, <laughs> uh, so so learning that discipline uh, of that you're not the the most amazing comedian after one good gig and you're not the shittest after one bad one is really important. But also that um, you can keep working and never see what you're doing, like never notice your achievements. Um, so let's come back to... I wanna, there's, there's so many things I want to talk about. Um, let's, 
let's come back to this idea of, of discipline, of getting of getting things done. Of, like you seem to be like a whirlwind of getting things done. Yeah. Now I sometimes find when I interview improvisers, mm. it's quite difficult because you're also fucking happy because it's just yeah. fun and you collaborate. It's enjoyable. You take risks all the time. You get rewards all the time from you know. Creatively. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but uh, what are you, you're doing? Lots and lots of things to a very high standard. Mm. And do you feel like you are a particularly busy comedian, a particularly busy person? Yeah, like sometimes, like I sh- my hand, I just see all the skin's coming off my hands. That that usually means I'm too busy. That's my sign. I'm too busy. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow, a little built-in genetic early warning system. It really is. When my hands are flaking, yeah, you know, I should hands, take a day off. Uh, that's actually how I go. I literally look at my hands. <laughs> so do you work until your hands too busy. flake? I work until... <laughs> That's the name of my next album. I work until my hands flake. But yeah, so I know that. And also my voice is a bit tired. And But it's just, it, but also, you know, it's so hard, isn't it? Because as a performer, you have to take the work when it comes in. And, and you know, we, we'll, we'll moan about it when we're busy, busy, busy. And then come September the 3rd, when we've got nothing to do, we're all like, <gasps> everybody hates me. Nobody loves me. Because you've got that whole week. Like Callum, my husband, it's like after Edinburgh last year, I, I, I kept getting like weepy about three o'clock. He's like, isn't three o'clock about the time you'd get a big round of applause? Because <laughs> 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 I'll be tired doing like oh. clapping at three o'clock to be like... <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> but isn't those... that funny because you've got, you've got used to peaks in your adrenaline at certain times of the day yes. for a month. That is, that That's is a habit. That's very good so advice. So at three o'clock That's you have... Very good and really noticing that time and going, oh, okay, I'm just feeling weepy because I'm used to being having a round of applause at this time. Uh, that is, to, be, to have that pointed out must make you feel so transparent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, kind of nice because it means someone who knows you really well goes yes. don't worry I know you're not insane uh, you're just this is what's happening at this point which is why I would always recommend not being with a non-performer or someone who's not in the same world as you because it's so helpful having someone who's like I remember what's coming home after some gig I can't remember what it was and being like oh, and then they didn't laugh and everybody hated me and uh, <laughs> goes 100 people died in China today <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're right. So like, it's really good to put it all in perspective. And I think I didn't, I used to not put anything in perspective. And, and because I went to a school, which was like, told everybody they were going to be the prime minister. Uh, like every time you're going to be the prime minister one day. And at one point me going, I really think there's something wrong with the maths here. <laughs> but, uh, but it meant that we all left school. Like we all have to achieve something amazing by the time we're whatever. Yes. And we went to my, I went to my first school reunion. So when I was 28 and, um, and, uh, and was really horrified at that school union of how many of the girls I went to school with uh, hated, not hated what they were doing, felt what they were doing was not enough. One of the girls I went to school with is a nurse in a cancer ward helping patients in their last days of life. And she said, I'm just a cancer nurse. <laughs> she said, I'm just a cancer I was like, what the hell? And I, I was, and, uh, but then she said, it's not as interesting as what you're doing. And, and you just realise how completely messed up the world is and how also that worldview. I love the idea. It took me a long time to realise, of course, because you come out of school and you go, everybody thinks like me. And then you go, actually, no, lots of people think in different ways. So how do you get rid of or, or you know, adapt to that lens so that you're not judging yourself on in stupidly high standards? Like It's too much. I went to school where like B is bad. B stands for yeah. bad. Yeah, so, I did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think that's very dangerous, actually. Uh, thing to tell people it's good because you get good GCSE results but I'll At be honest I'll be honest kids <laughs> you won't get far in comedy by saying I've got an A star in German <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I just say as well I, forgot, I think I told you this I can't remember but I was I was me and my friend me and my friend I, mean, I said friend that's nice my brother uh, Benji he's 11 years younger than me so his friends are a lot younger they came to see me in a show and afterwards one of the, his friends was like um, anyway, so like, tell me about your process. Sorry to go all goldsmith on you. <laughs> ah, isn't that amazing? That's right. Uh, no, it's lovely, but I will have to cut that. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't why? Like it. It's well, funny. Because you want to... <laughs> <laughs> I try to cut out anything where my guest, anything that could be seen as kind of, so, I'm broadcasting it, so I don't want to be self congratulating But I said it. You yeah. didn't say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, okay. come on now. <laughs> that's terrible. That, and that's that's... A, that's a good example of someone worrying what other people think. But why are you worried what they think? Well, they will love you. Back to They're you. listening to your voice. Yeah, well, that's the, yeah, 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 that's true. But, but, but hey, I'm not on trial. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's the thing. You seem to have a really... Um, 
what's the word? You have a really fierce approach to deserving happiness. Oh, right. Is that fair? Deserving happiness. Expand on what that means. What am I trying to say? Um, And I want to talk a little bit about Sunday Assembly as well and, and how that feeds into it. But I think you have, you are absolutely brimming with internal confidence Mm. And you have a very, you have a very naturally high status, I think. Yeah, people I think say you that. Are, yeah, I think you are a powerful lady and you have a lot of self-belief and a lot of self-determination. And when you just said to me then, but no, come on, that's you. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> I wonder if there is an echo in that. Is that the voice in which you talk to yourself? Or is that, where, oh. does, that, where does that voice come from? Have you done a... A course. A course? No. <laughs> I don't mean, I don't mean you sound like you've done a course. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a good thing to which I aspire, that sensibility that you have. Where does that come from? Well, well, I think we've all got the, of what I call the eagle of despair. So I used to have a bit in my show called the eagle of despair. And then I was, I was listening to Susan and she was talking about her crab. Her crab. And I, I, just, I was like, I was just I was thinking like about Susan, the <laughs> no. Uh, but but it was, I was like, uh, but I was like, it's okay. You know, they're, they're different animals. They're slightly different points of view. Uh, and, uh, and I love Susan. She, she knows if you're listening, Susan, she knows I love her. Uh, but yeah, so uh, the eagle of despair being, that's just like this, you know, the voice that tells you you're the shittest comedian ever. Why are you doing it? You should give up, blah, 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 blah. And I just... So I've got to a point where I was like, why are you listen? Why, if, if you really hate this so much, why are you doing it? Because that's no point. Uh, and also, do I really believe this voice? What is that voice? So really my question was more like, where's this guy coming? Where's this eagle come from? Who left the window open? So then I had to counter, I had to counteract it by, uh, and I think actually it might have been Luke Tolson at one point because I was doing my 2008 show, which he directed, my If Dot Comedy Award nominated show. Uh, everyone remembers those. Uh, and, uh, he... <laughs> how, how painful, <laughs> how painful to long your whole life to get nominated for the Perrier and the one year you get nominated, it has a forgettable and complex no, name. It's so, it's so funny oh. it? because, and now it's just called the Edinburgh Awards. So I think everyone just writes that on their poster, don't they? Yes. But it was a, it was a shame and also like it's also I think because before we used to just look forward to that party because there was so much free booze and then now the party's like there's only 12 people invited and it's a barbecue <laughs> uh, but anyway I will say uh, oh yeah so Luke I remember um, I also had a bit of a whine a bit of, I was a bit of a whiner to begin with so a bit of a like oh my god I don't know what I'm gonna do I mean, the show might not be very good the audience might not like me blah, 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 blah. Uh, a real like little fragile little snowflake kind of way and uh and luke and i was going what if they hate it what if they hate show uh, uh, and luke said do you want to do the show or not because <laughs> if you, because if you don't want to do it just don't do it but this this isn't going to help you is it and i was like mm, yeah was, and that was a really good thing no that, that's when you need those are the people you need in your life actually are the comedians yes. who allow you allow you to and who notice when you're feeling shit and you need a hug and notice when you need a punch in the face because Actually, yes. sometimes we do need a punch in the face and be like, <laughs> why are you, you know, worrying about what that lady in the audience said to you after the gig three days later? About two and a half hours ago, uh, at time of recording, uh, I said out loud to myself, alone in my flat, get a grip. And <laughs> it really, really made me laugh. <laughs> yeah. But I did feel better. I, it was a little, it reminds me of that um, Henning Vane used to have a bit of material about get up early in the morning, yeah. <laughs> make a list of all of the things you want to do and then do all of the things on the list. <laughs> and I, I, love, <laughs> I, I just think that that, I, I really aspire to that. Yeah. And you, oh, yes, okay, so you've got good people around you so who got can good give people, you the metaphorical punch. But also that I, I, I tell you what saved my life was the artist's work which is that book have you ever seen that book I, lots of people tell it to me I have fucking yet to love that book yeah. and um, I would recommend it to anyone my friend Lucy Trod who's just wonderful, wonderful uh, improviser Lucy. comedian she uh, she said to me and she's quite like I call her mother nature because she's so like oh come to me chickens uh, and she uh, <laughs> she and she said I think you need to do the artist's way but buy it put it on the shelf and it will call you <laughs> I was like all right so I did that I put it put it put it on the shelf and then I did the Melbourne Comedy Festival and I really was like this and that was my moment of I'm doing the thing that all the comedians really want to do I should be really excited but I'm really not enjoying this at all and uh, and I, so I spent and then I was really pleased that I did the six-week tour because I had a lot of time on my own 
doing 20 minutes of material fine, but in beautiful places and with really nice comedians and just like was really thinking like, what do I want to, like, what is this? Why am I feeling like this? Went through that time and then got home and the book was like, on the side and I did it. And the thing that really helped me was pages because, so pages is where you wake up in the morning, like Henning Venn says. So you wake up in the morning and you just write for, 10 minutes or something or you write, I think you write three pages freehand and you don't think about what you're writing you just write and you just let whatever comes out come out and, and sometimes you're just writing fuck 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 blah, blah, blah. or you might be writing a guinea pig woke up one morning so it might be a story who knows what comes out of you and I just noticed a lot of it was quite like um unhappy but then but I, then I started to notice that I'd start going everything shit blah 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 and then by the end I'd write I've written but you really love your life and you love what you're doing so so just get on with it <laughs> And so there was something about me needing to vent that anger, but then remember that I was That's having a good time. Because you were on stage venting a lot of anger as Loretta. Yeah, yeah. But then again, again I was so psyched. It's almost like, I suppose it's he, maybe she was my Orville or something. or Like she was saying stuff that, I, uh, she was venting anger, but it wasn't my anger. Do you know what I mean? Yes, like, it was so it's concocted. Like, yeah. And, so, yes. and also I was like, I don't, I suppose that's part of it. Was I wasn't angry because... Because I was re- really successful with that. So I wasn't angry about that. I, I think I was just angry that I couldn't find my voice. So in your stand-up, is there now a thing that you are burning to say on stage? Or is your stand-up a vehicle for you to enjoy yourself by making people laugh? I think a bit of both, Stuart Goldsmith. Uh, I think because... <laughs> sorry, sorry to Goldsmith you there. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the thing I love... So what I love about comedy is you get a room full of people who've never met each other and they all just sit and laugh together. And to me, that's so important. And, uh, and I love the fact that you can have, yeah, like people from all around the world. So you go to the 99 Club in Leicester Square. Oh, I don't think it's there anymore, is it? Uh, it was um, so long ago. I got booked for a gym. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> no, the, uh, the, the, but you'd have like tourists and then you have like a group of people from Essex and then some hen party and then a business thing. And everyone just laughed together and you go, oh, this is just so lovely. So I suppose my only message is remember that we can all sit in a room together and laugh. Yes. And uh, all my shows, my solo shows have been very much, was the first one was called um, don't Pippa Evers, don't worry, I haven't heard of her either. The second one was called There Are No Guilty Pleasures. The third one was called uh, Same Same But Different. And the next one is called Joy Provision. So I think there is a link there of this happiness thing. Of but and I hate the word happy. The reason I hate the word happy is because it, it suggests that we all have to be walking around with a big smile on our faces. Whereas what I'm talking about is just being comfortable in the fact that you we are ourselves, that we are all different, but that we can find something in common with each other. And you can find that in the room by just laughing together. I don't like having it as so much of a stamp. I think last year it was a bit of a, I did a bit of a stamp at the end of like, hey guys, we're all together, we're all the same. Which I didn't, enjoy. I didn't like the ending of my show last year because I felt like it was a bit too um, on the nose. I don't think it needs yeah, to be. Yeah, it's almost like the yeah. show itself makes your yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. You and that, so that. that's, the, so yeah. I think that's, that's the thing this year I'll definitely do is, because I, I hate writing the fucking Edinburgh blurb before the show. I hate that. So now you've, you've written the blurb and now I feel like the show I've written doesn't quite fit the blurb. And I, I know people don't really read that blurb, but it just annoys me in terms of someone coming, having, or not coming because they've read that blurb. My blurb's very specific. like, the world's going mad. So how can we be, how can we find joy in the world? I'm like, that's not really going to come up. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to come up. So, uh, so I think if I could change anything about Edinburgh, all the entries would be Pippa Evans, title of show, just come and fucking have a go. Like, yeah. Jimmy, that should be the title of it. And also we should have no sections in the fringe brochure because I hate being boxed by comedy. I'm not comedy, I'm not cabaret. I'm, I'm like entertainment, but entertainment is seen as a dirty word. Uh, so it's like... I'm, and I think that's true for most people actually so people go I'm doing a stand-up show but it's got songs in it but it's got songs in it as if like well then it's not a stand-up yes, show yes rather than I'm Please doing a stand-up the, show yeah. which hooray has yes, got songs in it yeah, yes, or, which, um, which benefits from having songs in it or like I do a lot of characters but they're not necessarily characters as in so I'll, the character, I'll break into a character through the talking rather than I've put a hat on and now I'm old Mrs. Miggins from down the road you know <laughs> so it's like the character stuff's still there but people go so you stopped doing character comedy it's like no I've stopped spending a lot of money on eyeliner and pouring it down my face every week uh so so that thing of of like we're not I sometimes worry that we're not allowed to evolve as performers as easily because 
uh, people go, okay, this is what, Stuart, you're, you do happy, jolly comedy and that's what you do. Uh, and then, like, if next year you decided to do something else, everyone would be like, what's happened to Goldsmith? Yeah, he's gone He's gone a bit yeah. weird. It's like, no, he's just discovering something different, a different angle of yeah, himself. It is, it, yeah, I've often thought whatever I do when I turn up is the act. Yeah. And I, I, I feel you have to hold on to a sense of of that for yourself no no whatever if you book me you get me doing whatever I yeah, want yeah yeah so so interestingly for me like I've turned up to two, uh, two or three gigs now where they've gone we really really wanted to book Loretta but they say you're not doing it anymore it's like well thanks a lot that's made me feel great yeah. <laughs> and then I go on yeah. and smash it as myself and feel like punching them in the face but to be like yeah yeah you know because it annoys me a bit because I think I think well if if I if Loretta was a, an easier sell for sure 100% but but there's a sort of almost a dismissive, a dismissive thing there. Of like, you know that I wrote and performed Loretta May. You know that that was me, right? So probably I can write and perform something else to the same standard, but it will be different. So yes, you won't be as funny in a angry American singer way. Sure. But it will be as funny in a confused, uh, uh, posh not posh person. Have you learnt this attitude? This attitude of yours of, I don't mean attitude in a negative way, this this attitude of, I felt like coming off and punching them in the face. Do you know what I mean? Because, <laughs> like, like, and you, you, you have talked, and I don't mean this in a negative way at all, few people on this podcast are as comfortable going, I'm really good at this, and I'm really good at that, and I know how to do that. You really believe in yourself in yeah. a way that's very uh, in, attractive, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, <laughs> what's a word that doesn't have the connotations of attractive? Do you know what I mean? But like, it's it's a really... It's a really inspiring kind of quality. Have you learnt that, is my question, or were you always that kid? Uh, well, that's an interesting, interesting question. Um, I think, uh, I think so, I, once I was on a bus and this old lady, I often talk to people on buses, this old lady said to me, did you go to Notting Hill and Eating High School for Girls? And I said, yeah. And she goes, uh, I said, how did you know? She said, uh, because you have an air of apology about you, but also, also a sense that you might one day take over the world. And I thought that was a really good summing up of me. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, that's it. Uh, so I think uh, uh, I think there's there's the difficult thing of growing up, going to a school where they say everyone's going to be prime minister and then yeah. being told never show off, never be proud of yourself, always, you know, always be humble. And you're like, I don't know how to marry these two things together. Mm. So I think, uh, I think, I suppose, I suppose I used to veer between um, uh, apologetic and arrogant. So I think I used to be quite arrogant, uh, but I was arrogant without the skills to back it up. <laughs> so I think now I'm in a place where I can be confident that I can do the thing I've said I'm going to do, but also comfortable when I don't do it. Like as if I fail. Is, you know it, a I mean? sort of a, is it a sort of um, like a benevolent version of entitlement? Like a good, yeah, like, maybe. Like some qualities, and I, I hate to bring this man up, but for example, Boris Johnson yes. has a sort of a, he's got that quintessential public school kind of, well, it'll all be all right because I'm me. That kind of attitude. Yeah, well, I don't like being compared to Boris Johnson at all. No, because I don't think he can do it. So he's bollock, he's completely talking shit because he, he, he's using that public school boy thing to make people think he can do it. But he can't do it because as we've seen, as foreign secretary, he's like shitting his pants. And so actually... Once he's been given actual responsibility, he's fucked. Ever, he's fucked himself up. Rather than what I suppose, I feel like, I feel like, I suppose also because I I got a lot of attention very early on when I couldn't, I didn't have anything to give back. So, but as in, as in, there's a weird thing that happens when you're a new, and I think this happens a lot with um, new act competitions. The person who wins often gives up <laughs> because because they go they go oh you do a great five minutes. Um, here's um, you need to be doing an Edinburgh hour in the next uh, in the next year. You need to be going doing twenty minutes in Jonglers next weekend. And you're and these people are like suddenly put into a world that they're not ready for. Uh, and so, so I was working with Steve Weiner yesterday. Do you remember Steve Weiner? Yes, I do yeah, remember yeah, yeah. Steve. So when we did the Hackney Empire New Act of the Year, he came first. I. Andy Osho came second and I came third and Jack Whitehall wasn't placed. Yeah. And of that competition, Jack Whitehall is like up here, no, it's a superstar. Uh, and I'm sort of, um, I'm, I'm a rising star. Andy's decided to go more in an acting way. Yes. Uh, and Steve, She's in the West End at the minute. She is indeed, yes. yeah. And, uh, and Steve uh, is working uh, in training people in communication. So he gave up comedy completely because he just did not enjoy that world. Mm. And I thought, I thought it was really great that he felt able to do that because... He just wasn't happy there. But I think that happens a lot. So when I got nominated in 2008, suddenly all these TV companies are like, what do you want to do? Let's make a show. And uh, and I just was like, I, 
I don't, I don't know. So, and then they go, oh, she doesn't really know what she wants to do. Uh, and so rather than, and again, that thing of that, that should have been, oh, it's okay. You don't know what to do rather than you don't know what to do. Oh dear. You're obviously not a very good comedian, which is how I felt, whether that, whether or not they were actually saying that this is me projecting sure. that on, but I felt like, oh no, I'm not a good comedian because I don't know how to do a television show. It's like, of course I don't know how to do a television show. I'm like 26 or so. I don't know how broad I was then. That's, let's do some maths. Nine years. 20. 23 yeah so it's very young uh to get that much attention and so so to feel like i i couldn't deliver i think put me in a bit of a spiral of uh i don't know what i'm doing and panicking about not knowing what i'm doing rather than being happy with not knowing what you're doing yes okay so what other mistakes have you made along the way uh what other mistakes have i made and i i feel like you're someone who is sufficiently confident that i can ask that without you is that Jimmy Savile on the wall behind you? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason we have that is because that's my husband dressed as a Boy Scout stood next to Jimmy Savile. Wow. Okay. Jimmy Savile's holding a check like he's buying my husband. Oh my lord! It's okay. So creepy. I'm, good. Good God. Okay. Oh. Sorry. Let me. Uh, let me. Uh, <laughs> let me focus back uh, on what you're saying. I feel like I can ask you about the mistakes you've made. There are some acts who I think I don't want to ask them. What mistakes okay, have you yeah, made in yeah. case it sends them down a path? But I think you will probably have a healthy appreciation of things that you've done wrong from which we might all learn. I think I, I used to lose my temper quite a lot. I think I used to get really annoyed with, when things like things didn't go what my well what my well, my way. So I'd get really frustrated by um so not necessarily with people, but but I think people can feel your vibes, you know. So I think I would just get really angry. I used to get really jealous quite a lot of people doing well because I felt like it meant I wasn't doing well. And again, that's something I had to work on. So me and Ruth Bratt, who's one of my best friends. Yes. Um, and what, you're very good friends with Ruth. Ruth is excellent. Ruth is an excellent I, I never, I never want, I was thinking about this because I thought Ruth might come up and I thought, I never want the podcast to sound too plummy. Like oh, I I'm see. Giles yeah, yeah. Brandreth going, <laughs> darling Ruth. But uh, Ruth Bratt is excellent. Darling Ruth. And, uh, <laughs> and she, I can't remember what it was, but uh, I think I was just having a, like a bad run of, so the, the other thing is, so, Again, that's from, hindsight's such a great thing, isn't it? So when I first got any attention, I was sent for these auditions for parts that I literally was not right for. And also women's parts in their 20s are fucking awful. And anyone who's writing anything, please think about women as more than just tits next door. Because every part was like, hi, I've just popped right to buy some milk. Oh, um, she's wearing a short skirt and she falls over. I mean, it really was like 1970s kind of stuff. Uh, and I wouldn't get it because I just, because I didn't look right, because... And obviously my heart wasn't in it. But also I'd never like done these auditions and stuff before. So it was all a learning experience. But again, rather than seeing it as a learning experience, I was like, <clears throat> I'm shit, I'm the worst, I'm a failure. Uh, and I get really and then I can't remember, Ruth got some part in something. I don't even think I'd audition for it. Because again, um she she's short. Um, we were often described oh no, was it scratch or a showstopper? We were described as um uh, someone said to someone else, "I really like, um, I really like that that lady in Showstopper, uh, not the tall, statuesque blonde, uh, the short, fluffy one." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we love that description. Anyway, she got a part in something, and I was literally like, I felt myself be canned like with rage, and I was like, "Why?" I really had this moment of like, "Why am I angry that my friend, who I love, who I think is brilliant?" It's doing well. And I thought, this is not good, is it? And I sort of sat on it for a bit. And then I sent Ruth an email. And I was like, I just need to tell you that I feel really jealous and I'm really confused because I love you so much. It makes me emotional talking about it. And, um, and, then, and then she said, um, and she emailed me back like, of course you're jealous. You think I'm left bit of the Oh, it's so cool. This is podcast gold. And then she and she was like, of course you're jealous. I get jealous too. And um, I think just having that moment where someone acknowledged like that we're all having a shit time and sometimes was lovely. Yeah. And I suppose I see that as a really important moment of my development because because it was it's so lonely being a comedian sometimes and um, so much of comedy is having bravado and allowing yourself to be vulnerable sometimes is so important. I think. Thank you. <laughs> You're right. Come here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man. But also, like, oh. shows you how important it is to have good friends in the business who yes. you can trust that you can say things like that too without knowing yeah well and you know that, and that must have been like six years ago or something and see it still upsets me but only because I feel sad for me at that point being in that situation and feeling like like yeah like 
like I, I'm really sad that some some for some reason at that point I felt like other people doing well meant I wasn't doing well. I think a lot of people suffer from that. And so I do try really hard with new acts to be like, you know, don't don't feel like you have to beat anyone else that like we are all dancing to the beat of our own drum and we have to be happy uh with what we're doing. That's the most important thing because you spend so much time comparing yourself to other people and it's so painful and destructive. Well done for emailing her at the time and saying so yeah. and being honest about it because I can't imagine... I, I, I well, This might be an interesting track. I can't imagine a male comic doing that. <laughs> I'm wondering, I'm trying not to be sexist, but is that a particularly... I think the way that a, a male comic would have handled that is to fester for 30 years and then have them on a podcast and go, hey, man, I used to really resent you. Um, I think that's... Maybe, maybe let's... Don't worry about the gender aspect of it. But that is like, I, again, I would aspire to that sort of emotional intelligence of being able to say to a friend, I've realised I'm really jealous of you. Mm. Well, I suppose if you don't, rec- you know, it's like anything, any good friendship relationship, you have you know, shitty things happen and you have to acknowledge them and just go, this is how I'm feeling or what I've done. And then you have to say, and then you sort of, I think just acknowledging something actually helps break that down. Because I think being, I think jealousy is so such the, the worst thing. I found this amazing essay, and I can't remember who wrote it, but it was one of the best things I read about it. And it was like, being jealous is fine; you can be jealous, but if it lasts for more than five minutes, there's a problem. Oh, that's good. That's so it's like, of course, of course, if you see someone doing well, you go, what? What does that mean about me? Because we also the other problem is we work in an industry which relies on us judging ourselves by each other because we're in kind of years, school years in a way. We're like, oh, we started together and. I remember I was saying to Ben Norris at a gig, I was like, I was the first gig I was headlining as Loretta and he was maybe opening. And I said, this is so exciting, Ben, because the first time I ever met you, I was doing an open 10. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing the 10 and you were headlining and now you're opening for me. And in my head, that was like, like, isn't that interesting? But obviously to Ben, it was like, you're failing, I'm winning. And it was, yeah, I mean, so, so, uh, so we, you know, and I, t- and he said something to me like, well, thanks very much. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but, but it really, again, like the, you know, the, these things happen all the time. We're constantly comparing ourselves to each other and we have to notice these things because they are the things that fester and make you bitter. Like we've both met a lot of bitter comedians. And I think that I had an amazing uh, evening with two comedians. I won't name them all. Uh, but one of them was Rich Morton. Uh, and I, I think, again, he saved my life a little bit because I think I just did this take. I did the, um, I, I was supposed to be in this TV show and they basically dropped me at the last minute. And it was supposed to be a big thing. And then, and, you know, again, you think you're the only person who's had these experiences. Uh, and I was really hurt because I felt like we'd got so far with it. We'd done some writing, blah, blah, blah. And then it, it essentially was, this isn't a vehicle for you. This is a vehicle for someone else. And in many ways, it was a compliment. It was, if you're in it, they won't shine as much. Uh, but a, a bit of a backhanded compliment of, so therefore we're going to cut you. <laughs> and so uh, and so I was really like, oh. And then I was going to this gig with these all, all male, bullshit men comics. And you're just like, oh, these aren't the people I need to be with right now. <laughs> and Rich Morton was there. And um, one of the comedians was just going on and on about everything that had fucked up in his life and how no one cared and all the TV shows that rejected him. And, and I was like looking at this guy going, I'm going to become this guy. I'm going to be the guy who hates themselves and, and is angry with everyone. Um, and, uh, and I was looking at Rich and he was just sitting there like calmly listening and giving good sort of... Mm, yeah. you know oh that's yeah that must be hard yeah and then we got in a lift and we were on a different floor me and Rich and the lift door shut and he went oh god will he ever shut up <laughs> <laughs> and I went oh my god thanks I'm so glad you said that because I was really worried and I told him the whole story and he went oh Pip don't, don't, you, don't you worry about it this time, once upon a time I was given my own show on the BBC they'd signed it off and everything and then the commissioner changed and they said we're not going to make a TV show anymore I was broken oh my life was I was, I was just like what am I doing but you know what I think I think from here it's, quite, it's taken me a while to get to this point but I'm doing the thing I love I'm paid to do it I'm having a great time so don't you worry about that show because that's just one thing of many things that are going to come your way I was like this guy is who I needed to be with this yeah. weekend. You know? What a gift to have that time with him. So I'll always, he's always in my pocket of um, people, yeah, good, good voices to put in your head when you're feeling a bit lost. Thank you. That's lovely. Um, I'm, uh, I was really engaged with that, so I didn't bother thinking about the next question. <laughs> oh, man. 
that was that moment was that was that email to Ruth was that a I'm trying to get gauge how pivotal that moment was I don't know you well enough personally to know how often you cry I'm a very tearful person I don't know whether that moment like the fact that you were very emotional talking about <laughs> it is representative of it's the the love you feel for Ruth or the time you were you know the the emotion you felt at the time or whether like that was I think you sort of said that was a key moment when you went hang on I've got to Got to sort this out. I've got to say, I've got to say, uh, get a grip to myself. So funny that you say I'm not a tear, I'm not that you don't know that I'm a tearful person because I always think people think oh God, people's crying again. Uh, I don't get uh, that at all. I really, I'm great. No, no, no. I cry. I, cry. I don't. Well, maybe I don't cry as much as I used to. I don't drink as I used to drink more than I used to. There was something also. I'm like the amount of drinking that goes on in, and it's again, it's changing, isn't it? The amount of drink drinking that goes on. I, I, so a few of the mistakes I've made have been drinking too much at chortle parties. <laughs> and so I don't do that. I gave up white wine. So you know, Loretta Main has a song called White Wine Witch, and I love that song, and I still sing that song because that's actually I realised a song about me, and that uh, that I used to I used to so I used to worry that I was an alcoholic because I would drink. Not like all the time, but when I did drink, I'd drink white wine and I would just go mad and, and wake up and not know what I'd done and have upset people by God knows saying what, God knows what. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm an alcoholic. And I kept trying to give up alcohol. I was like, well, I seem to be fine about on every drink apart from white wine. If I drink white wine, I just go nuts. Uh, and so I gave up white wine. And since then, I've not had any incidents of being insane. And I was like, I was like oh my God, that white wine witch song was literally me talking to myself uh, but uh, subliminally going, Pippa, you really stop drinking white wine. And whenever I tell people that, they're like, how could you not know that? How could you sing a song about white wine for five years mm-hmm. uh, and and not realise that song was for you? Weird. So, Have uh, you seen Rick and Morty? No. I just want to put anyone listening to this who's seen Rick and Morty, There's a, it's this very anarchic, fast-paced cartoon. I won't go into detail. There's a character who is basically, there's a scene where he's young again. He's an old man. He's young again. He's at high school. But he's secretly in a cryo chamber somewhere dying. Ah. And the kid is being the cool guy in high school that he never was and getting the guitar out. Except only thing he's singing is, I'm trapped in a cryo tube. Help me, kill me, kill me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a similar sort of message to yeah, oneself yeah, yeah, from yeah, the yeah, subconscious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, um, I don't know. What was that? What was the question? Oh, pivotal. Um, so, uh, so... Um, mm, so I think it was pivotal because I, I, I can't remember exactly when that happened. I remember we were in Lucy Trod's house uh, and she was living in um, uh, Tottenham at the time. So it must have been four, four, five, four or five years ago, maybe. Um, so it must have been a pivotal moment because, because yeah, I, I wouldn't remember and react like that to it if it wasn't. So, yeah. But I can't, I can't maybe I can't really answer that question. It was... It was definitely just a moment. I suppose it probably was all linked because I think Melbourne. When were you in Melbourne? Four or five years ago. You were there in two thousand thirteen. I know you've you? been there past in other times as well. I haven't. No, no, no. Um, I, no, no, no yeah, no, Stuart, I, you make that point. No, no. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, all I mean was I watched your Melbourne Gala clip this morning and it said two thousand thirteen. So yeah, two thousand thirteen. Gosh, was it? So that's four years. Four years ago. Um, so it must have been maybe around that time when I was okay. already questioning what I'm doing and why why I'm doing stuff that makes me unhappy. At one, one point I wanted to say, are you sure you haven't done a course? Because you're, you're very, you know, you, you you seem to have a very good grip on yourself. Uh, oh, well, I, well I, haven't done, I, I mean, well, so maybe it's a good time to talk about Sunday Assembly. Well, this is, well because... thank you for making explicit what I was about to print yeah. into. Because I was going to say, if you hadn't done a course, probably Sunday Assembly m- must have some of the effects of... Oh yeah, I reprogramming s- your software. Well, so Sunday Assembly was so uh, for people that don't know, Sunday Assembly is was a project is a project that me and Sanderson Jones, who's another well, not not really a comedian anymore. He's now a secular. He's a full time Sunday he's Assembly. He's a full time secular leader, uh, and he uh, he and I were in a car going to comedia to do a gig, and he and we were talking about stuff, and then one of us said like, oh, I really wish there was a way to do church without the god bit because we really like all that community stuff and people." Churches and on organised religion, the thing they are really good at is community and people working together. But if you don't believe in God or doctrine, then how do you manage to get that sense of community? And, uh, and the other one was like, yeah, that would be really great to try and do that. Should we try and do it? And we're like, yeah, OK. So um, we decided to try and create church without God. Uh, and uh, four and a half years later, there's about 70 of them around the world. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> and I should say, I don't know how completely explicit it is from you saying that, that you are directly responsible for. Like, it's yeah, not, it's not yeah. that everyone else Sardison had the idea. We are the co-founders that idea. of Sunday Assembly. And uh, we, yeah, and so we just came back from San Diego with the fourth international conference of Sunday Assembly. Uh, so, so the point of that was to find space. And I think, yeah, I mean, it's all totally linked because it was about me not being able to find space to figure out who I am in a way that wasn't like, this is how you should be. So a lot of courses that you go on are not offering space, they're offering solutions. And actually we don't need solutions, we need space to think and be free to consider ideas about ourselves. Do you, from If you've not done any, how do you know that? Uh, so I re, I've read a lot about courses gotcha. and I've thought about, you know, there's a lot of them that I've clicked on and read and then gone, because a lot of them make big promises and I just think you shouldn't make big promises yes. because it should, again, it's like this time frame thing. In this weekend, you will learn how to love yourself, live a fuller life, <laughs> um, get rid of those bad habits. Like you're not going to learn that in two days. What you're going to learn in two days, you're going to get really inspired and then you're going to fall flat on your face a week later because nothing's changed. Um, so it's really about long term space. So uh, how do you find space to develop yourself if the only space available has um, people saying, and you must believe in this and you must believe in that? Yeah. It's like, actually, what about a space where we go, here's some ideas, here's some other ideas, here's some other ideas. Uh, how does that make you feel? Uh, and so the, the only caveat of Sunday Assembly, there is a charter, but that's only like more about how the space works. So it's like, it's not religious, but if you are religious, you're welcome. So it's at the front, the top of, uh, if you go to a Sunday Assembly, no one will say, people who go to church are idiots. Because the other thing is, I went to church when I was 17, so uh, I have a lot of respect for religious people, and half my family are very religious, um, So, uh, and, th and they're great people. So it's also that thing of like, just because you believe in God doesn't mean that you think gay people should die, you know? So I was looking at the, the Sunday Assembly website, and I would, I would direct anyone towards that website, not least because it's an incredibly good website. <laughs> it's really well designed. Oh, great. But the FAQ on it... That's frequently asked questions. They are really fascinating because they, they you get a sense from reading the FAQ what sort of challenges you've had along the way mm. that that you well you still you I mean you're well, not so named I, so on the I'm, team I'm, anymore. No, you're... no, I'm the chair of the board now, uh, which is a very formal position because because I said so when we after the first one we did it was really successful in Islington lo like loads of people over two hundreds of people yeah. turned up and they weren't all you know I didn't recognise. Hardly any of them. And so, as you know from gigs, like, you expect to see like your mum and your dad and <laughs> yeah. a couple of friends and, and no one else. Um, so, so that, yeah, we'd obviously really hit on something. Uh, and um, Sanderson, when we finished, Sanderson was like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I said, this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. This is a part of what I want to do for the rest of my life. So, uh, again, it's like, so is that, uh, which kind of ties into me doing lots of different things is I'm not interested in just doing one thing because I think I'd get bored. Um, and I like that I'm still passionate about it without it being, you know, if I get a T-shirt and I wear it over and over again, I get bored of that T-shirt, you know, so I want to make sure that I, I keep being fascinated by it as a project. So describe just brief, because if Sanderson doesn't do comedy anymore, yeah. so I'm unlikely to have him on the show. So this might be our only bite of the mm. cherry. So obviously it's an enormous project. What could I expect if I came along to a Sunday assembly somewhere? Uh, you would expect a, and we sing pop songs instead of hymns. Uh, and we have, instead of a sermon, we have someone doing talk about something interesting, which fits in with the motto, live better, help off and wonder more. Uh, and uh, we have a poet or someone sing a song like a, instead of a reading. So instead of a Bible reading or a, a Quran reading or whatever. Um, and we have a moment of silence as well. So everyone sits together in silence. Uh, so it's like a sort of meditative, contemplative moment. Uh, and then afterwards we have tea and cake. But then, so that's the service sort of element of it. And then outside of that, there's lots of projects, which is um, about, um, so peer-to-peer -peer support. So having little groups that we meet up with on a regular basis and you check in with each other, like, how are you doing? How's your life going? Uh, and also like community action. So sending people off to go and help charities and groups. And, and did you kind of, did you sort of look at everything a church does and go, oh, that's a good idea. Let's yeah. do that without God. Yes, so that's one one of the things that's been done and also other religions as well. So just looking at different different community spaces and how they work. So it's like a alternative community, yeah. Uh, but it's about this, There's a, it's, it's more than just like a hiking group that you will go hiking and then you go to the pub. It's like this slightly bigger element of living your life. So I think, and I think that's what's really important about it is that a lot of people are lost and scared and they need a space where someone's going to say, where you can say I'm lost and I'm scared and someone will go, okay, well, let's work on that, you know, rather than 
okay, here's the answer, or um, or yeah. you're like, oh, what, why the weirdo, you know? And it doesn't cost anything to attend. No, it's donation based. Donation based, but we do, but but people who come more than like three times, we we sort of expect a, a regular donation because it's like you're using the service. Things ain't free, you know. We still yeah. have to pay for stuff, so so we do. So you of, get a tax break status, and if you don't, does that annoy you? Uh, I think we do. We do get because we're do charity. You? We're officially a charity. Game on, well yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, I so I I don't earn money from Sunday Assembly at all, uh, and uh, I like to reiterate that. Uh, but it's yeah, it's really quite an amazing project that will hopefully carry on long after we're dead. And it, again, right, we won't figure out what it is till it's finished. But I credit Sunday Assembly with me being able to speak in my own voice because I had to. Like, I suddenly was in a space where people were like, "So it's an atheist church," and I'd be like, "What? No, that's not what it is," uh, and have to defend. It, and I, again, I would get quite angry quite quickly because people would say stupid things. Uh, and then rather than responding with kindness and that sort of hearing that someone has, an, has misunderstood it, instead I'd be like, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like a, like yeah. a priest would. Yeah, like a <laughs> <laughs> And I, I think I got so cross because people, because again, it's this thing of being nebulous. So we, again, as performers, we, a lot of us are nebulous, but the, uh, we are figuring out we're constantly changing and evolving. And it's much harder for people to grab onto that. By people, I mean like the industry. So the minute you go into the industry, it's really hard. And I, I totally understand because we as humans like it when we go, he's the gay one, he's the, the posh one, he's the cockney one, you know, uh, and um, there's the woman. Uh, but they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, so, so when, when, so again, with Sunday Sunday, people are like, oh, so what is it? Uh, it's a, uh, it's like, ch- it's church, but it's, um, but it's like church without God. You're like, well, it is based in church, but it's not exactly like church. So, so yes, there are elements of church in it, but uh, as we've kind of grown, it keeps sort of morphing. Uh, the only thing it will always be is a secular space. So it's like, uh, and that journalists don't like that. No. Uh, so they start sort of saying what it is uh, and then saying things like, are you trying to turn atheism into a religion? Let's go, no, because it's not atheist. Atheists are welcome and will never be challenged on whether there is a God or not, because I'm not interested in whether there's a God or not. I am bored of talking about God. So, so what interests you is the... People who need people. Yeah. I've, I've often thought, and I think I'm sure said on this show that I would like to be religious because the software seems like a really good bit of software. Yeah. All of the all of the all of the all of the positive elements of it yeah. are really positive. Yeah. But also a uh, friend, yeah. confidence, yeah. community, all yeah. of those things. And also people that will check in on you and again it comes back to this having friends yeah. that you can say and be vulnerable with and that you could or who will who will call you on shit. So when you're behaving in a way that's hideous like that someone will go, why are you being like that? And again, not like stop behaving like that. That's yeah, not yeah. how we behave in Sunday Assembly. Being like, what's going on? Why are you being a dick? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, I, it's like an almost kind of Darren Brown technique of interrupting someone's anger. I've often wondered whether if someone, like if someone were to start a fight with you in a pub and you responded with, like if someone said, are you looking at my bird? And you responded with, are you all right? Yeah. <laughs> it might, yeah, yeah, it might yeah, be yeah. a different, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Different it really is. I remember actually once Callum was uh, on the, in the street and a, this, he brushed by this guy and this guy went, why the fuck are you punching me? Why are you touching me? And he put his hand on his shoulder and went, are you all right? And the man just went, Ooh, and walked away. Yeah. Uh, because he just, yeah, he was just obviously having a really shitty day and just couldn't, but couldn't cope with a human saying, are you all right? So do you attend Sunday Assembly? So, so this is so this is where the Venn diagram gets messy is because Sunday assembly is on a Sunday morning, which is when Showstopper rehearses. So uh, so I go when I can now. Uh, so I used to go every single time and you know uh, run the band and do the singing and lead all that stuff. But also for it to grow, and I really believe in this as well, for it to actually be a real thing, it has to not rely on me and Sanderson. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think at the moment we still need to be at the centre as in talking like figuring out what it is um, philosophically but we don't necessarily have to be there in person at every single Sunday assembly because if it's an idea that works it should work without us are there any downsides to it? are there problems with it? of Does course it... yeah you know it's, it, you, you get any group of people more than four, three people you, you can't have a conversation easily you can't have a discussion easily there's fractions people get into little cliques um uh, there's uh, how do you control what, what's going out you know it's the internet uh, there's 
there's two of us, there's three people in the office, really, uh, and there's uh, 70 around the world. How do they have any kind of check on them? But also, how do you check on people without being like, we're checking on you, how mm. are you doing it right? Because it should bre- be able to breathe. Again, it should be their space, but it has to be done within the Sunday Assembly way. So, And the frequently asked questions, one of them is, what happened in New York? Oh, which yeah, is a yeah, fabulously yeah, yeah. telling kind of a thing. Which is so I, funny because that must that's so well because that happened in the first year. The, sure. But again, that was but it's that again that thing of um, being allowed to not like it and leave. Yeah. So, but uh, a lot of, of what you get is people that go, "I like this idea," but what I'd really like if there was no songs and if we could just talk about how much we hate Jesus. Yeah. You go, well, that's great. You go and do that. If that's what you want to do. Sure. That's their space for that, I'm sure. But this isn't that space uh, because I'm I'm just not interested. I, it's really interesting hearing you talk about it. I looked at the website. I looked at the photos. I like the idea of it. I'm very attracted to the idea. I suppose, if I'm being honest, I looked at the stuff and thought, I don't know if I would try that because I, I was sort of interrogating myself on the bus. Why would? Why? What is it? What? What are you finding not attractive about that? And I suppose I my preconception is that it would somehow be. Um, that it would somehow be as bad as church. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> kind yeah, of like yeah, there's yeah, some yeah. sort of like, maybe it's not the God that I don't like about church. Maybe as someone who was made yeah. to go to church as a kid at school, you know, um, maybe it's not the God I don't like. It's almost like I don't want to turn up and discover that it's as shiny faced as I found church. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose in a way it is shiny faced, but we do have talks about not shiny things like you know, death and stuff. So it's like really tackling life stuff. But um, but it is quite shiny. And the reason for that is is uh, whether there's a reason that I was a Baptist, not a Roman Catholic. Mm-hmm. So uh, one is very shiny and one is not. And I'm quite a shiny person. Like I like songs and stuff. So it's going to yeah. have that element in it. So it's so it is about, I suppose that is the show bit. That is the bit that you come and you celebrate life there. You celebrate it. And actually a lot of people find... It's really nice to be in a room with 400 people singing. Yeah, it does sound pretty great. It's really fun. <laughs> I remember I, uh, I emailed you regarding my wedding. Oh, uh, yes. I said, uh, I, that was our most recent contact. I said, uh, we're having a bit of a group sing-along. Can you suggest some songs? And you sent me back a text that was like, um, yeah, I get asked about this a lot. <laughs> yeah, I do, yeah. But yeah. I, and I don't mind because I love the fact that I, I find it really funny that I've become go-to wedding secular wedding sing-along girl yes uh so because about our wedding we had when i'm 64 by the beatles instead yes. of a hymn and i think it's really because again there's something about us all singing together it's lovely um yeah. and and there is something we really as humans enjoy about making noise together like when you look at football or the chanting and stuff that's you know that's all tribal behavior we're all looking for our tribe i was i looked at the uh the paper evans and other lonely people um uh, video on YouTube. There's like oh, a, yeah, an, old, yeah. an old show reel from years and years mm. ago, eight, years, eight, nine years ago. And um, the, from the different characters that you were doing there, I did wonder, it's almost like one of your characters could almost be a sort of a, an Islington girl who's come up with a secular church. Do you know what I mean? This, Which one's almost... that? The one who's door knocking? No, no, no. I don't mean, I don't mean a specific character. Oh, I, I see, mean, yeah. It's almost like that. I could see you having come up with a character who'd have had that idea. Yeah, and Richard Marsh got in touch. He's a comedy writer. Oh, and he I know said, Richard, yes. you know, Richard. And he said, um, oh, can I pick your brains? Because I'm writing a sitcom about a secular church. Ah, ah! okay. So, uh, so, so it is being done. Uh, I don't think I could... Because at first I was like, oh, is that weird for me to give a... But actually, I, I couldn't write a sitcom about it because it's too real like as, as in so a lot of people thought because we're two comedians that it was a joke yes uh, and someone got in touch going um guys uh just want to let you know that my my edinburgh show is also a church f- theme thing and we're like yeah it's not an edinburgh yeah. show <laughs> <laughs> uh, also a lot of comedians and i bet this because what made me laugh listening to your podcast was when you go and here's the code uh, for you to say that you want to be on the show but to, to get me to yeah, separate yeah. the comedians who just want to be on it from the ones who actually listen to it which made me laugh because then i got loads of comedians being like hi pippa uh, sorry i haven't seen you for ages but i just wanted if i could get 10 get 10 at the sunday assembly gig <laughs> <laughs> like what the fuck do you think it is yeah right okay uh, yeah that is interesting like it's it, it could almost be a kind of Andy Kaufman-esque yeah. prank where yeah. you do a big rug, rug pull 10 years yeah. from now. And, and I have, when it started, I had a massive, again, a crisis of confidence because I was like, what is it? And people getting confused. And so sometimes when I do radio interviews for promoting something like uh, solo shows or whatever, they go, and now let's talk about Sunday Assembly. And I go, well, 
No, because yeah. it will confuse the shit out of your listeners. They'll be like, so is am I, is this solo show a sort of, like yeah, a, right. feel like a pyramid scheme or something? You know, like they're going to come to my show and then I'm going to sell them Sunday Assembly. Um, so I think, again, so I keep those things very separate, yes. but the but there there is obviously a lot of me in both of those things. And, um, and I think if you went to Sunday Assembly and then you came to my comedy show or vice versa, you would see the same um, sort of naive joy. <laughs> If that yeah. makes sense. So, okay. so I think Sunday Assembly is a naive idea that is getting stronger. So it's a naive idea based in truth at the moment. So by that, I mean that it is only an idea and we have to be okay with the fact that it, there will be things that go wrong, that uh, some there will be uh, schisms, there will be some people that don't like it, there'll be some people who love it so much they, they, they're they almost holding it too tight and you need to prize their fingers off it. There, there's so many great people involved with it, I can't begin to tell you. Um and uh, and we have to allow that to fail in the same way that I had to learn to allow myself to fail as well. Again, you talk it the way in which you're talking about it is sort of a bit post doing a course on how to talk about a thing. You're like you're you're so um, like you sound so mature in the way that you are talking about it. It has to be its own thing. Some people want to know this is, and I'm just interested. Is that is that learned or is that innate? Do you just see the world like, well, obviously, if I create my own secular church, then some people will hold it too closely. Do you know what I mean? It just, it, no, you're but, so kind of... Um... Well, it's learned through experience maybe rather than, you know, so it's been four and a half years yeah, since okay. the project. And so we're only just starting to see... So I've got this line when I, when I teach improvisation, I always say it's really hard to teach improvisation because a lot of it's about feeling, like a lot of it's about connection and um, the best improvisation. So this is like theatrical improvisation versus like, what, oh, I'm a chimney. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and so a lot of it's about feeling. So I would say um, the audience uh, don't know what it is, but they definitely know what it isn't. And the same thing with us, we often go, mm, that doesn't feel right. So it's definitely not that. Now we try something else. Oh, yeah. it's not that. But, and we're sort of slowly shuttering down onto what it actually is. Yes. And, the, and I think that's the same with our voices, with our choices in life, with our opinions, with our politics, whatever it is. Um, but we have to, that line kind of has to be made of, I don't know, jelly or something. Like it can't be, it shouldn't be a strict line. Or maybe even a circle. I'm doing an image of a circle with my hands. But um, I don't know, there, there has to be that give in it as well of uh, it can go a different way. There is no one path, Stuart. You're about to do Joy Provision, your new Edinburgh show, yes. in the Cabaret Bar? Yes. In the Cabaret Bar. Yeah, What's that, 180? 180. 180. lunchtime Jim show? Jim Bowen. What time? Yeah, I love lunchtime shows. I'm yeah. all about the afternoon slot. So, it's so much nicer. And also, I think because I'm not... Uh, an, I'm not a, like an aggressive or sweary, really, comedian. It's quite family. I'm quite family. So, mm-hmm. so I think it suits me better than drunk... Stag parties will never... Well, no, I think they would have a good time. In fact, that's a lie because lots of Bannermans, at Bannermans, loads of stag parties came, but they weren't quite drunk enough. They weren't drunk yet. Because it's early enough. Because it's day. early enough. Yeah, Exactly. Great. So I great. have... A, yeah, so I, I really... You've got to really that. commit to fucking up a lunchtime show. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I wanted to move from free fringe to back to paid fringe because... Um, because I, I absolutely love Bannermans and, and Bannermans was 100% where I learned to be myself on stage. And I love the gang there, like Christian who runs the bar and everything. They're just like so relaxed. I mean, it's a heavy metal, but, but there's, no, there's nothing. He was so funny that like, cause, cause I get a lot of Radio 4 audience, um, cause I do a lot of Radio 4. Uh, these people will be coming in and be like, excuse me, do you have a Pinot Grigio? And he's like, we've got two wines, red or white. <laughs> 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 so I, I really enjoyed being there and they were so good to us, but um, uh, but I think now the thing that's missing from my show is the pizzazz. And so I need proper sound and proper lights. So, cause it's, it's a, you know, it's a room in a pub and they really kind of let me use their sound system, but it's, um, it's a heavy metal sound system, not a before, like not a show bit sound system. Yeah. And also there was one light, it was a floodlight and you had to flick it on and off from the wall. So, uh, when I did my run at the Soho of same, same, but different, the, um, the thing that was different about it was that it just had that extra element of, professionalism which is lights and sound yes and it just makes a big difference which as a show person yeah absolutely that's a a thing oh for sure and and if i was a straight stand-up bannermans would be absolutely i would never leave it i would never leave it trevor locke's been after me every year and he's like i'm never leaving yeah because it's so good the other thing is i feel like with the free fringe is such a gift for us that um if you have a space and you um 
And so I was like, people having to like push people, like people had to leave so much so that health and safety came down and then stopped letting me fill the room. So I ended up having just 60 people at a time rather than 120 because of fire regulations. Oh, fire. who's going to have a fire in a damp cave? Uh, but then, so it meant that uh, the room, it, it was annoying because when it really was full, it was just joyous. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that if you are oversell- overflowing a room, give that room to someone else and move to somewhere else, which is bigger. Like, take the plunge, like, be brave, you know. Let, uh, go. And do you feel, that. well, this is my question. Do you feel that you, like, how are you feeling? How confident are you about switching from a free 60 to a paid 180? Yeah. That's a big gear change, It's a big change, gear change. Right? It's a big gear change, but I sort of feel like, you know what? Um, if the Pleasants believe in me enough to put me in there, for one, that's really a confidence boost. Uh, and also, obviously, we have the same agent, uh, the wonderful Chambers, uh, and they... If they believe in it enough to do it, then that's fine. I also think that uh, it's great that people will come to your show for free. Now is the chance. Now is the time to check. Will you pay to see me? Mm. And if they won't pay, then let's think about that. But why? Why don't they want to pay to see you? Yeah, that's that's another conversation to have, isn't it? It's like, well, if they don't pay, if they're not paying, what what are you not doing? That's making because I, I think I think what I've noticed in the last few years is obviously there's more and more acts are coming from the paid fringe to the free fringe. Mm. And most people listening to this will know exactly what we're talking about. But on the free fringe, there is no disincentive for an audience member who doesn't know you to try mm. out the show because they can wander in or out of their own behest. Um, and uh, on the paid fringe, you know, once I don't know what your ticket price is, but it's not uncommon to be between ten and mm. fourteen or fifteen quid in a big venue, honey. Um, and I suppose in the last few years, I've seen lots of acts move from the paid fringe to the free fringe thinking, hey, I don't want to lose seven grand to be up here. I want to go home with a couple of quid because I've, you know, because I'm performing. Now, you, I think, are the first person, you're, you're, I don't think you're the first person to ever do it, but you're the first person I've spoken to about that specific change back mm. of of going, uh, of yeah, hoping they hoping they come with you. Well, I suppose also there's a thing about um, what for me, the free fringe is the place to experiment. And that's why we need the free fringe, uh, because you can't experiment on the paid fringe anymore because it's such a big gamble because of money and everything. So I had three years on the free fringe uh, trying out. And if and I feel I feel like if I'm taking it seriously uh, and I and I and I would like people to then pay for a tour, then I think there's just something about showing the audience something with pizzazz rather than. Uh, oh, so a lot of people say, you're, you're too good to be on the free fringe, which annoys me as well, because they're like, there's loads of really freaking excellent people on the free fringe, but I know that I need that tech that tech thing. And I, I think there's something about transitioning back. So I've experimented. Now I feel like I've found my voice. Let's put it out there with all the bells and whistles and see what happens. Uh, and we'll just see what happens. That's about as far as I've thought it through. I mean, I, I, I'm sort of, I, I could be worried about it, but I feel like, Sort of lot of energy. I haven't got time to be worried. About it. I'm too busy. My hands. Look at that flame with skin on my hands. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I suppose. I suppose I could. I, there's obviously the. So again, I have. I have the. Um, the little voice in my head that's like, <gasps> no one's ever going to come. It's going to be awful. It's going to be The thing I do like about the cabaret bar as well is you could have fifty people in there. It would still, be still great. feel like a so. Great it's, so yeah. I, I think it's that, and I think it's also about not beating myself up if it's uh, only a hundred a day. One of the worst experiences for me on the fringe was when I moved Loretta into a bigger venue, and that was for me the nail in the coffin. Was uh, I moved from the caves to the guard George Garden thing to a tent. And uh, there was just like no sign. I couldn't afford the posters, and it was just hor- It was just horrible. And I was in a hundred and fifty seater, and I had like <sighs> maximum fifty people in there, and it was horrible because it again, it's like so much energy that I was just having to fill that whole room with my energy, uh, and uh, everyone would be going, it's "Such a great show! It's such a shame nobody came to see it." But I thought, if this is what happens to Loretta with no with with publicity so i was still paying a pr person and all that mm-hmm. and uh, supposedly in a better sort of space you know more prestige and all that bollocks um but pippa evans is selling uh, is is rammed even though my title is pippa evans don't worry i don't know who i am either uh it's uh is filled every day in bannermans that shows to me that the weight is with pippa evans not with the retomain 
Uh, and so I feel like now is the time to do the opposite of that seesaw. Yeah. So I think I think like all a lot of comedy is seesaw. So um, Ken Campbell, who we work with on Showstopper, used to say, "If you're going to make it up, it better be better than if it's written down." Yeah. So we worked Showstopper to the point that we can improvise this to the standard of a written show. Uh, but that means that if you can uh, if you can improvise to that point, if you can improvise to the point uh, that's better than it's written down, you, you better be able to you better be able to write to the point better than you can make it up. Does yeah. That okay. Yeah. So I'm now Jesus. now I think uh, I'm. I'm at the point where my writing and my improvising are, are of the same level and I had to work to get to that point Showstopper is an incredible show I've seen it several times and I think um, it is absolutely the show that you can go back to and go back to and go mm. back to you did a West End run of it yep I was talking to Ruth about the financial implications of it and how okay. it doesn't make you very much money no but it pays, it, it does pay, but it doesn't make as much money. And I think. Given that it's like a huge West sure. End production, she really but was it, explaining to yeah. me the numbers involved in how many people are involved in making it happen. Yeah, and, and also that we were, pay, we were paid equity minimums. So um, people say it doesn't make you much money. It makes you as much money as being in a chorus of a show does. And that's mm. how much money it should be making you because we're all the same. So that's the other thing is. Uh, it's quite interesting being in it because obviously as a solo performer, it's all about being the star. And as a improviser, it's all about us being the same. So Yes, but in a chorus line, the person in the chorus line didn't create the material they're doing. The person who created the material they're doing is sitting on a huge pile of money. Yeah, there's, there's no. luckily there's no one sitting on a huge pile of money because you can never make any money from the material because it's gone. So yeah. it's not like Les Mis where you can sell the CD forever, sell the music. People tour it. They do it in schools. There's all that stuff going on. You can never tour uh, the show we did last night, Up It, a chaffinch family in a tree in Cambridge. Uh, you know? So, yeah. So uh, so there's also that thing, isn't there? Any gig or any show you do has to be for one of the four Ks, kicks, kudos, cash, or creativity. What? Who's is this? I love it. So it's a bastardization of something musicians often say. Uh, and so, so, uh, so yeah, Showstop is not about cash but it is about kicks kudos and creativity for sure we all love doing it it definitely buzzes our minds and uh, people now go oh my god you're in showstopper although for the beginning it was like what's showstopper <laughs> and yeah. now people are like oh my god showstopper so uh yeah so so and it's great for me because it's in the grand so that's a 750 seater and then they will see me and then they can come to my solo show and so that's a great crossover marketing thing for me so so from a selfish point of view, it's a great thing. But also just as a show, I, I don't think there's anything that I'm prouder of than Showstopper. I can't ask you anything else about it because it's improv and it's just brilliant. I mean, you, I can't ask you how you do it. How do you no, do it? No, it's just, it's just, you just skills. You just, it's like being a good footballer. It's like you just, you just practice. That's it. And, and improvisation is a really good, the reason it's so good for you is, again, as a control freak and someone who has been like angry and frustrated at by other people in their past in the past um you have to fail you have to accept other people's offers you have to do what's maybe not what you want to do you have to be taken in a different direction uh, and i think again i think that was something i struggled with because at the beginning was so when i first started doing comedy i was like i want to have a tv show like victoria wood that's what i want uh, and then as i started doing comedy i realized that that's not what i wanted at all and I didn't know what I want, which is a bit like this thing of the audience doesn't, knows what it is, but they definitely don't, don't know what it is, but they definitely know what it isn't. So I definitely knew it wasn't that, but I didn't know what it was. And Showstopper started dragging me in this way. I started doing more improvisation and started to me, wanting to do like, um, you know, all this stuff. And I started to feel like, oh, no, I'm being dragged down this improvisation, kind of more nebulous comedy path. But but I want that TV show. So And so I've... Instead of going, oh, it's okay, this is the way we're going. I was going, ah, ah, the, the vision is, is going, rather than just going, fuck that vision. It's not, it's not your vision anymore, babes. It's gone. Done. And if those things happen, then that's fine. But it has to be, it has to go from a place of joy rather than a place of, I really need a TV show. Yeah. In terms of stand-up, are there any bits of someone else's stand-up that you wish you'd written? Is there a bit that you covet? Oh, I don't know. I'm not, uh, I don't know. I don't covet bits so much as I I just really... <laughs> so, you know, Fumbi, uh, yeah. I, I could never say anything he says because he says it all as a black man. But uh, uh, but he he did a really funny bit the other day. I can't bastardise it, but just about the police stopping a party and um, and the police saying to him, like, just tell your friends that we're not all that bad. And him wanting to say back... How about you tell them that we're not all bad? <laughs> I really thought that was so funny. Uh, 
so uh, yeah, I do, I just admire a lot of people, and so it's less about individual lines. But I love the way Sean Collins sits on a stool. Like I just find that hilarious. Uh, I just I just go. Oh, I wish I could sit on a stool. There's no way I could sit on a stool. Um, <laughs> Plenty of stools in the cabaret bar. Uh, Give that a try. Uh, I love. Uh, I really I really went. I saw Susan Coleman's show at the Soho Theatre, and I loved her energy. Uh, I loved the fact she was just there because I'm always on. I'm always in the room before the show. Like I, I always greet my audience. I like knowing my audience and I like saying hello. And when I came into her show, she was already on the stage and I thought, oh, that's an interesting way of doing the the, the same thing. And it just means that you're just like, ah, oh, we're just here. We're having a, an, an hour with Susan, that, that's it. And I really like that kind of casual way of it rather than the, please, welcome to the stage. You know, that kind of, I'm so special, uh, hype, hype, hype. It was more like, yeah, come in now. Let's talk about some things. Off you go. Um, I love that. Um, I love, I think Al Murray is amazing and, uh, I loved, I did, he did a thing where he had a plant in the audience and me and Rachel Paris and Gemma Arrowsmith and I think Ruth as well. We alternated being the the singer in the audience who's like, he's like, oh, oh, who me? And then getting up and smashing a song out of the park. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just loved his whole show. Like I just love his audience reaction, interaction really speaks to me and I love audience. I think I find it amazing to go to a show and there be no interaction with the audience. I think, why the fuck are you being, why are you being live? Why be a live show if you never even acknowledge the fact there's people in the room? I went to a theatre show the other day and it was so fucking awful. I wanted to stand up and go like, what are we doing? <laughs> Surely no one's enjoying this. <laughs> but and I find that funny. Like, why have we been conditioned not to speak? Like, everyone just sits there and suffers in silence. I, I quite like it. People go, always ask about heckling and stuff, don't they? But I was, I was like, well, I don't like heckling, but I do love joining in. I love it if I'm talking about something. I I did a, jo- a, jo- a really funny joke about Stacey Dooley. It's a whole bit about Stacey Dooley uh, and, uh, and, and sort of about how she's not the best jo- journalist in the world. And this woman went, I really like Stacey Dooley. And I was like, well, I really don't like Stacey Dooley. And then we just had this great little conversation uh, where we decided, we sort of decided whose opinion was more important, the person in the audience or the person with the microphone. Uh, and, it, and I just really enjoyed that, that moment. So I, I've never, so I love anyone who can do good audience interaction. Rob Broderick, I, I could watch him improvise raps for days and days and days. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could list, I will just sit here and list a million people that I think are okay. amazing. Okay. I, I'm fond of asking people whether they got what they wanted out of comedy. I suspect that you have. How can you even answer? I'm only, I'm only like 10 years in. How can you even answer that question? That's a crazy question. Have you got what you want uh, so far? Uh, I mean... I do, I, that sort of suggests that there's just one thing that you want, though, isn't it? So I suppose what I've got out of comedy is the um, the ability to not be so secure, uh, not, not secure, so um, fixed on what I want. Maybe that's what I've got out of comedy is getting rid of any fixed idea of what it should be giving me. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Stuart Goldsmith. What time is your uh, Pleasant's Cabaret Bar show? This oh, year's Edinburgh Festival. Of course. Um, my show, Joy Provision, is at 2.40 uh, p.m. at the Cabaret Bar in the Pleasant's Courtyard and Showstopper is at 6 p.m. in the Grand... Oh, and I should also plug the Glenda J Collective, which is a improv super troupe, which is me, Ruth Bratt, uh, meet the woman who made me cry uh, uh, Josie Lawrence of Who's Learned Anyway and Carrie Ad Lloyd and we do a our improv show which is just the most fun and I'm just on it I mean I, I could have talked about that for two hours when is that when is that when that's at 11pm and it's only the third to the fifth so it's the first three nights of the weekend I think okay yeah great and my own show uh, is called Like I Mean It and it's on for free at the Liquid Rooms Annex. I suddenly sounded alien in my mouth, but it is called the Liquid Rooms Annex, uh, which is where I was last year at 3.45 p.m. I've, I will no doubt mention it on the accompanying blow of the show, but, you know, while we're in the room, let's get it done. Ladies and gentlemen, Pippa Evans. Bye. So that was Pippa. Thank you so much to her for coming on the show. And please, if you listen to that, if you enjoyed it, do not miss out on her Edinburgh show. And and she may well be touring after that. You can also see her in Showstopper uh, at Edinburgh and the West End and on tour and all over the world. Um, But don't miss out on her stuff. She really is an absolutely effervescent performer. Just one of those people that walks on stage and you immediately relax and think, oh, this is going to be brilliant. So lots more interviews coming up soon. Still in the can, Orlando Baxter, Joe DeRosa, the Lost Episode from last Edinburgh, Fest, uh, last Edinburgh Festival. I shall chuck that one out soon too. Uh, Barry Cryer, Simon Munnery and plenty more besides. So send in your donations forward slash donate. 
you can donate via the medium of buying a t-shirt at forward slash merch at the discounted price for one more week or another extra week if in fact it takes me a while to sort out a ladies price sizing not price a ladies sizing comparison chart because i didn't realize that was a thing and now i realize it's a thing so i'm trying to get on that um and that is all of that do come along to Everyone's a Comedian. I will give you the date for that as soon as possible. You can stay in touch by joining the Facebook group for this podcast uh, and you can suggest guests and your uh, questions for guests that I've got coming up. Um, I had an incredibly nice text from uh, a, a direct message on Twitter from Ross Noble recently. So uh, Ross is in my mind. Go and see Ross if he's touring at the moment. I'm not sure. Um, or check out that episode from the archives if you would like to hear what a profoundly warm, supportive and a very funny performer he is. Um, but I think after I spoke about being nervous, he got in touch with me after I spoke about being nervous before my interviews. Some of you have got in touch and, and offered various things and solutions to that. I should say the, the nerves aren't performance anxiety so much as sort of the fear of being caught. So I suppose it is still imposter syndrome. And I, I know I've got all these solutions for imposter syndrome, all of this remember your value stuff. But um, it is... I, it still makes me very tense. I've got a bunch of interviews coming up in Montreal. I'm going. I'm very lucky going back to Montreal Comedy Festival soon, and um, I I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it. But at the same time, I've still slightly got the horrors because of the nerves, because of the interviews. Because what if my guest? I don't know what if. I don't know what it is I'm talking about. I I would listen. There's there's plenty of places for this chat. This isn't necessarily one of them. I'll post Amble at you in just a minute if you're still around. Uh, but for now, that concludes the actual podcast itself as a thing. Speak to you soon. So as you can hear, I've yet to resolve this thing. I've had a weird bundle of nerves this weekend. So I did Glastonbury, which is a huge amount of fun, as it invariably is. The first two days we were there, we go very early because we, we work there. Um, we The first two days we were there, the sun was baking and painful and very difficult to deal with the wee screaming boy and me and the wife looking at each other and thinking, we are terrible parents. Why did we bring him here? And then he perked up and had the time of his life. So that was nice. But... Um, very physically demanding, as, as the festivals are, if you spend ages at them. And the shows, I really enjoyed. I emceed the, uh, the cabaret tent, which is huge when rammed and huge and empty when empty, um, as it sort of flows and fluctuates throughout the day. That was loads of fun. And many thanks to everyone, uh, Charlotte and everyone, the, the team at Haggis uh, and all the people that, that work backstage and produce that glorious event. Um, but nervous about it because I... Because it's such an unknown quantity, and it strikes me that performing, and sorry again for the state of my voice, I just, you know, it's not even just staying up late and drinking and shouting, <laughs> it's just exhaustion, but it is also those three things. Um, I suppose there, it's that old question, isn't it, of if you get used to something, if you get used to a particular type of performance, we're all walking a tightrope, aren't we, between doing the same old thing and taking too many risks aren't we we're all we're all somewhere on that we're all going to either go oh no this is my show this is this is the 20 i do bosh there it is take the roof off and that's one end of the spectrum and on the other end of the spectrum is got to create new material got to take risks got to got to not be stayed got to take risks in the room someone says something i've got a great joke about that thing do i say that great joke i've said a hundred times or do i dive in and take a risk and try and go further everyone is somewhere on that spectrum aren't they and i suppose because i respect and value all of the potential phases of that spectrum, if a spectrum have fa has phases, you know, all of those different things you can do when someone says, it's just by way of an example, you say, what do you do for a living? They say, let's use, let's use the Al Murray, Al Murray example. I talked about this in my interview with him. He asked someone what they did. They said, I'm an actuary. He said, Reary. And I hold that to be one of the single best pieces of improvisation. I've spoken to him the first time he said it, it was improvised. So let's use that as an example. Once that joke is then in your back pocket and you come across an actuary again, you have a split second to decide, do you do your old joke? You, you know, which was once beautiful and creative and new. And then maybe it's a hundred times later or 10, whatever, 50 times later, 20, two times later. Everyone's got a particular place on the scale, isn't it? We're like, oh, that was a moment. It was great. Bang. It happened. It was incandescent. Let's leave it and move on. 
the 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 more craven idea is to hang on to it forever and keep using it forever and if you someone says that you know a thousand gigs later there it is that's what i always say and i suppose the frustrating thing is that there is no right answer and so for me i have yet to make a decision i've yet to make the decision as to which of those numerous different people or acts i am so therefore i think i sometimes go into performative situations feeling like I haven't made my mind up yet and maybe that's what contributes to performance anxiety to the to the the nervousness because I do that sense of being keyed up on the day before a gig especially at a festival you spend the whole day trying to relax and enjoy yourself knowing your gig is over your head knowing it's it's looming it has a looming quality and I enjoyed both of them enormously. The, I, I compared on the Saturday and then did a set on the Sunday. And the set was terrific fun. And even that, I mean, you know, I've, I've spoken about this before. With this new show, it's more personal. It's more honest. There are fewer slick punchlines. And that's what I want. I want to go away from just going joke, joke, bang, joke, 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 joke. Um, and I want to be more myself i passionately want to be more myself and and now is the speed wobble stage isn't it it's like is this working did this work did this did this whole year of new writing technique and new approaches to it is this going to bear fruit and if it does what fruit does it bear you know if if, if i go and have a terrific edinburgh does that mean i was right if i go and have a dreadful edinburgh does that mean i was wrong or is the the genus of the idea that germ of the idea is that pure despite the reaction? Ah, oh my God, what am I talking about? You know, you know what I'm, I'm trying to say. Sometimes in science, you look for a specific reaction and then you know whether that reaction happened or not. And then you go, good, this means X, Y, Z, the project was a success or a failure. In art, it isn't like that. I suppose what I'm saying is I'm trying not to be slick anymore. And the slickness, I think was there for a reason. And I think the reason was, if I've got a perfect routine in my back pocket, then I don't need to be scared. And what I'm trying to do these days is go, I don't need to be scared anyway, because I'm good. So rather than honing and scripting and crafting a perfect routine, actually say what you mean and get closer to some bigger truth, some bigger, more important thing. And then you're halfway along the journey, you know, maybe not halfway even, but you're on that journey and then you do a show and a bit kind of goes, yeah, people look at you like, yeah, that's, that seems true, but we're not laughing. And then the craven part of you is like, oh God, I better get back to the slick stuff. I better get back to the, all the things that, that work, that save me, that make it okay. And you have to forge ahead anyway, don't you? You have to recognize that and go, no be sillier. I think I've said that on stage once or twice in the, in the previewing of, uh, of the new show. I think I've said that to audiences that I'm just like, I've said something along the lines of just once or twice. I've said, some, I've said something like, this is difficult, isn't it? Because half of you are just looking at me going, why are you saying this? And the other half are going, do it harder. And then that normally gets a laugh because obviously that sort of refers to a real, a true tension in the room. So, so far, so noodly. I think, I mean, I, I, I had a really good time at the festival. And it's really lovely to stretch the material by doing it in such wildly different places. You know, I did a, on the Monday, I did the second Hell Week preview to about 20, 15, 20 people in a tiny room. And then some of that material was in the set that I did and the comparing stuff I did at Glastonbury to an enormous tent <laughs> at one point with only the same 20 people in it, but uh, at one point with considerably more. So here we are. Will I listen back to this one midway through Edinburgh and go, oh, well, I know the answer now. You just don't know, do you? You never know. And you just forge your head anyway, going, I think, I think I've got a sniff of something. I think this is, I think this is the right thing. And who knows? <laughs> even by my standards, this is, I'm going to turn this into a catchphrase. That was a rambler, even by my standards. <laughs> I feel like I've said that more than once. That's all good. It was terrific taking the boy around. Um, he had a wonderful time running around and interacting with various pieces of walkabout theatre, some of which appeared to welcome interaction, uh, some of which initially appeared to welcome interaction, and then it turned out they didn't especially. <laughs> but um, 
Uh, he had an absolute whale of a time, whether meeting 10-foot-tall stilt puppet creature pelicans, or not pelicans, flamingos, or whether just looking at a painting of a daisy on a bin. What, what a great time we all had. Really special kind of family experience to be in, in our own little family as well as the, the wider circus and theatre family of that festival. And, uh, and we all had a lot of fun. Thank you if you're a couple of the people, if you're one of the, the, the people who turned up, three or four of you, I think, turned up over the festival and, and uh, said hi or made cash donations or said something cool. Uh, one of you, <laughs> one of you, whose name I didn't catch, walked up and uh, donated whilst I was emceeing on stage. And I have to admit to being very, very confused. It was, I think it was the first section of me emceeing. So I hadn't even made a relationship with the audience yet. And someone walked up and just started talking to me <laughs> as I was trying to perform to hundreds of people. I mean, guys, thanks for the money, but uh, don't do that. <laughs> I sort of assume a certain level of sophistication from you all. Um, but I, I can't imagine that'll happen again. Do not turn that into a running joke. I thank you all. That'll do me for now. Thanks for listening. If you have been... Um, I hope by the next time I speak to you, I will be in much finer fettle vocally. I'm going off now to drink water, gargle TCP, and hopefully get over this hay fevery cold. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye for now. Oh, God. Hey, there it is. <laughs> I don't know if you heard this bit, Daryl. Sorry, that was me thinking that my... Uh, phone had it had gone blank and it wasn't waking up and that was me thinking that uh, I just recorded all of that to silence to silence not to silence to uh, you know to no one <laughs>